Okay. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're looking forward to having several very interesting talks today at the workshop on token-based authentication and authorization. Um, this is a collaborative effort between SciAuth and uh, TAG PMA, and we sincerely um, appreciate the NSF Cybersecurity Summit uh, hosting us this year. Um, and uh, we have on tap, uh, as you see from the um, from the agenda here, uh, a series of talks from our friends at the WLCG. Um, that'll be followed uh, by a talk about tokens in the Tapas API platform. We'll take a 10 minute break at about 11.30 Eastern. Uh, and then we'll have Dimitri Mishin talking about using CI logon OIDC service with Kubernetes, uh, followed by a talk from James Clark on Psy tokens in LIGO. Uh, and um, Brian uh, Bachelman will talk to us about HD Condor and the MSG token transition. Uh, there was a, a two day transition workshop just at the end of last week, which was very informative. Uh, we'll take another break and then we'll see what we learned and see where we need to go and, and uh, try and uh, gather some, um, some action items for the community to, to focus on before we wrap up at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, if before we get going further, um, again, I'm reminding people we are recording this. It's primarily to facilitate no, note taking. Um, um, and we'll you know, go forth with that. Um, there is a Slack channel. Uh, if you got a, a trusted CI link um, and the, uh, the channel, is it? The Summit 21 community channel, is that right, Jim? That we're supposed to be in if we're doing stuff there? Yeah, we, we can use that. Uh, yeah, so if you're more comfortable using that, alternatively, please feel free to just put things in the chat channel, chat uh, here in Zoom. Um, and we do have a, a transcript service also running to help us uh, take notes. So hopefully between all of that, we'll capture everything and all the great things people are going to tell us today and we'll be able to write that up and um, uh, give people a report on what we learned here today. Um, are there any questions before uh, we proceed? Um, should uh, I'll, I'll just relinquish the share here and let others get ready um, for the first presentation. Um, Jim, would you like to say anything before we get started? Um, well, just on behalf of Trusted CI, welcome everybody. Um, Trusted CI is our host for this workshop. And as Derek mentioned, this is um, co-organized by Tag PMA and the SciAuth project. Um, and so I think you're all probably familiar with at least one of those, but for more information, tagpma.org and sciauth.org. But um, I can't think of anything else to say, so uh, let's let's jump right in. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, yeah, I think we're probably. Uh, Good to go and go ahead and get started a little bit early if you don't mind. Um, Hannah, are you going to start or or uh, is someone else so, speaking? For hello, us? everyone. I'm on a train and my signal is really bad, so I've pre-recorded pre this. So Dave offered to play oh, it. So hopefully that works. Okay. No, that'd be great. Thank you very much. I would suggest that Derek and Jim stop your video because that way this can be full should should go full screen. Hi everybody, welcome to this session on WLCG. My name's Hannah, I work at CERN and I'm one of the many people who have put these slides together and have been working on behalf of the WLCG authorization group trying to push WLCG towards tokens in the future. 
To give you a quick overview for anyone who doesn't know WLCG or the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, we're used for high energy physics data analysis. And since the 2000s, we've relied on X509 certificates, both for client and user authentication, and then VOMs for authorization. And since 2017, we've been looking to move to JSON Web Tokens over OAuth2. And we've been meeting roughly every two weeks since then. So it's been quite a few years now, and we've made some considerable progress that you can see in this slide. I won't go into details. Um, we've, we've run some pilots. We've identified the software that we want to be using. We have set up a token schema, and now we're on the stage that we're actually deploying the software and we're having people testing it out. So we're really making a lot of progress here. Um, and many thanks to everybody who's participated along the way. The schema itself we published in 2019, and the important part of this is that it allows middleware developers to start actually enabling token-based authorization, working to an agreed schema. It's available on Zenodo and the link links to in the slides here. And we also have a working document on GitHub. So if you do have any comments, please just raise an issue and we'll make sure that we, we take a look at them during the calls. The design itself, as you can see in this schematic, we're trying to follow the Arc Blueprint architecture as closely as possible, which is the, the little image in the bottom left here. So the Arc Blueprint came out of a project that was funded by the European Commission a couple of years ago, and probably many people in here either worked on the project or are already familiar with it. And the benefit of this is that we can reuse best practices and we have guidelines available for, for the questions we might have. The software that we chose was, is Indigo IAM, and uh, that forms the, the main component, which you can kind of see in the middle here, the WSEG, AAI, AAI being authentication and authorization infrastructure. In our case, we have a few optional CERN-specific components as well, where it makes sense for the experiment in question, which it doesn't for all of them, um, but for a few, it does make sense to embed them quite firmly into the CERN environment, which I'll come back to in a in another talk a little while later. In terms of the token flow, we're anticipating a small number of registered clients and a large number of unregistered resources. So the clients will be responsible for receiving access tokens and refresh tokens, transforming access tokens if required, and then forwarding them onto the resources who would perform probably offline validation to avoid overloading the system. One thing that we've been looking at in recent weeks and months is the command line flows um, and usability is proving to be more of a challenge than perhaps we anticipated. So if anybody here is working on similar topics and we're not already in contact and working together, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Over the coming years, we're hoping to begin the fade out of certificates, but importantly, we recognize that X509 will continue to play a vital role in our infrastructure, both as host certs, but also for maybe admin users who might want either want to keep their certificate or need to keep it for some edge cases that haven't been enabled for tokens yet. So this is a very early plan and significant changes are expected. We've already uh, gone through some of the stages we've set up or we've, we've integrated RC Auth, which is an on-demand on IOTA certificate authority. And this allows us to have some backwards compatibility with the certificate infrastructure. We're currently setting up uh, the new system, I am, and we are migrating VOs, uh, the, uh, the virtual experiments, to that. In parallel, many people are adding token support to different components of middleware. And we expect to be running in some kind of dual mode for the next few years before we start privileging the use of tokens and then ultimately removing X509 user certificate support. So today we have a few lightning talks. Uh, so one from Mine and Dave on Fermilab and what's happening there. Another one from myself on how we're deploying IAM at CERN. And then one from Jim on CI Logon and WLCG. And then a final one from, from Dave on Condor with Rolt, which is one of the command line use cases. And then after that we have Andrea to talk us through the IAM development roadmap. And I hope we have plenty of time for questions. I realize it's quite a tight agenda, so fingers crossed. Oh, any questions for, for Hannah in the intro? Should we move on to 
ですね。Ready, Mine? So I wanted to show you an architecture of our infrastructure. I mean, it's it's obviously it's a little bit complicated, but you know there are a few things that I want to get your attention on. One of them is Vault. That's our token repository and the Vault client. These two components are really at the heart of our infrastructure. Uh, the other part is CI logon token issuer. That's our token issuer. As you can see, Vault is the OIDC client to the CI logon token issuer. And then we have a vault client that just requests and you know retrieves the, the tokens from the vault. Uh, and then we also have an LDAP and the ferry. Ferry is our uh, attribute repository that we we store all the information about our users that basically stores the access policy, you know, which experiment a user is member of, uh, what type of privileges they have. And then we replicate that information in LDAP so that CI logon can read this information and then they can issue the tokens. So these are the basic things I want you to really remember from this, this picture. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so transition to tokens, you know, where are we in the, in the phase one? So all of our software development is completed except for some patches. We have still, you know, some bug fixes and patches we need to do. But apart from that, all of our uh, important components have been completed. Uh, and we are moving our components into production. CI logon LDAP is already moved to production servers. Ferry is in the process of moving. 
uh, but we are not in production yet. I want to clarify that. Uh, we still need to do a lot of testing. We have finished our own testing, testing the software. We found some, some issues, we need to do patches, but um, you know, our own testing has completed that the components we build are working, but we also have something called experiment testing. That is, we take it to the scientists at our laboratory, the experiment, and then we ask them to test it. And, and you know, they have different use cases, they have different ways they use the tools. And that's really is very important for us because that's when we cover a lot of the problems and scientists can use the tools in different ways than we thought that could be, you know, they, they might be using. So for that reason, we created a token task force group that's composed of the experiment members and we meet with them bi-weekly. So we, we go through, you know, what are the basics of obtaining a token and doing basic tests. So we are currently in that phase that we are asking our experiments to start using tokens in an experimental way. Um, next slide, please. Uh, experiment feedback. So, uh, you know, we have a large number of VOs at Fermilab and we cannot allocate all of the VOs, a, you know, individual token issuer for each of them. So five of our international VOs will get their own token issuers and the rest of our VOs will be served by the same Fermilab CI logon token issuer. Uh, the, the five VOs with the individual token issuers, they went ahead and started testing. That's kind of more straightforward case. They, they demonstrated that they can obtain tokens and they can use the tokens to submit basic jobs and access the data. So the simple tests have been verified that they can do that, but this is only with our five VOs that they have their own token issuers. The, the remaining VOs that falls under the Fermilab CI logon token issuer, they, we will need to do more in-depth testing with them. There are still some issues because they're all sharing the same token issuer. So we need to fix that. I mean, if you're interested, you can, you know, we can cover that in the questions part, but I'm not gonna get into it right now. Uh, so we will, we will do more testing basically. Uh, next one, please. Okay. Uh, so our earlier plan was to finish all experiments testing by January, 2022. But as I said, we found some issues with those sub VOs that falls under the Fermilab um, and with the token issuer. So we need to fix that, especially with the user mapping that caused a little bit of a problem. So this pushed our testing schedule a little bit back a few months at least. So we are still waiting for patches on that. We need to work on some solutions, but I think our goal is now to finish the experiment testing by the end of spring, 2022. I think that might be a reasonable goal. I think we will, I mean, obviously this could change. We, we are discovering new new issues every time you test, but we are hoping we could, we should be able to finish it. Uh, once we, once all the patches and fixes are in place, once we know our architecture is finalized, then we will start creating a transition plan. Uh, our very rough transition plan is that we, we should be able to start transitioning one or two VOs to tokens in the summer. Uh, you know, we will operate our infrastructure in a hybrid mode. Some of our VOs will use tokens and some will use certificates, but we think that it's a reasonable goal. If the experiment testing goes as we expected, we should be able to transition one VO in the summer or one or two VOs eh, in the summer. And then we will see, we will operate in the hybrid mode for a little while. Huh? So that's, that's all of my slides. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, Mine. Um I had a question just because I was I glanced over and, and the word profile came to my head and I was wondering, um, is there a specific profile that you're following in, in your implementation or? Um, yeah, we use the WLCG follow? schema. Yeah, we follow okay. that. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Minay? Hey Minay, this is Brian. I had a question about your uh transition here uh since since well one we didn't get a chance to talk about it last week but uh two you know it, it wasn't quite clear what you mean do you are, are you talking about uh experiments interacting with grid services that, that is you know pilot submission and, and things like this or are you talking about uh actual user jobs that are 
uh, utilizing tokens or, or 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 none of the above. <laughs> kind of what, what do you mean by transition here? Yeah, actually, when when I say transition, I include both of them. That you know, a complete transition for 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 us is both the experiments using, for example, their own Glide and WMS or other tools to to be able to submit jobs, but it also includes the analysis jobs. For example, the user is submitting individual jobs. Huh? So, you know, to me, transition is an experiment wholly start using tokens huh? and they don't need certificates becoming optional. Huh? Does that answer what you're asking? Yeah, well, I, I guess the, the follow-up then is how does this mesh with the, the OSG uh, retirement uh, goal of February 22, for particularly for pilot job submissions. I mean, I um, I don't see a problem there. Maybe can you explain a little bit more? Why do you think? I, I, I can I can answer. It. And yeah. The, well, first of all, we're we're using the uh, the um, HD Condor distribution of of HD Condor, which is they they're going through October. But but I think that we'll pro I expect that we will be transitioned earlier with for the pilots. Okay, yeah, that, that was the one that really looked like it was maybe not meshing, but it, since you clarified it's more of a uh, uh, c continuum where multiple things are coming online, I, that, that makes sense. Great, uh, let's see, what do you have upcoming next? Is that, uh, Jim, are you up next? Yep, I think I think I'm up next. So let me good. Hopefully you see that. Um, and uh, so I'll just give a quick overview of work so far in CI logon to support the WLCG JWT profile and other token types. We just heard from Mane that we've been working with Fermilab to support the WLCG um, tokens. So uh, first, let me give a quick overview or introduction to CI Logon for those who haven't heard of it before. Uh, we've been around for over 10 years, and our goal is to enable secure logon to scientific cyber infrastructure. That's where the CI Logon name comes from. And we aim to do that in a seamless way, to provide seamless identity and access management to research projects using federated identities. So researchers log on with their existing credentials from their home organization using uh, using in common and, and educating uh, uh, research and education federations around the world. So we're currently supporting about 15,000 active users from over 400 organizations around the world. These are active users each month. And as part of that support, we're not just doing the authentication, but we're supporting um, all the life cycle around the research collaboration, onboarding, offboarding, members of the collaboration, managing attributes and groups and roles within the research collaboration and doing it in a way that uh, supports man uh, consistent management across the multiple applications that that research collaboration uses. And so to do that, we have a backend system called co-manage that manages those that, uh, enrollments, and groups and attributes, and that exposes the information to applications through multiple APIs. So uh, we still issue a lot of X509 certificates to those um, science apps that need them. Um, we issue OIDC ID tokens, JSON web tokens, SAML, attribute assertions, and uh, we also support LDAP uh, queries. So the goal is to um, support many APIs so that science apps can plug in in, in the way that they need. And uh, we're inspired and uh, by the Arc Blueprint architecture uh, as the model that we follow. And so you see here that CI Logon fits in as a proxy where researchers logging in with their credentials from national federations. Uh, we're adding attributes from community attribute services and uh, community authorization policies. And so that's how we can issue tokens with authorizations that are specific to the, uh, the research community. So uh, we, uh, we started out supporting OpenID Connect ID tokens for uh, communities like CIMA that have OIDC applications that need user attributes, group memberships, um, both from the researcher's home institution and from the research community. 
but we've uh, we've extended support in CI logon to support uh, JSON web tokens for authorization. Um, so you'll hear later today about LIGO using SI tokens. Um, in that case, um, the token contains an authorization scope values based on LIGO's authorization policies. And so CI logon is able to configure those policies on a per client per subscriber basis based on those inputs from campus and the research community. We also support WLCG tokens uh, with Fermilab being a very important motivating example for us. And we're supporting both group-based authorization through WLCG groups and the um, uh, capability-based based authorization through the storage and compute scopes in the WLCG tokens based on, again, the policy defined by Fermilab. And finally, we've been working to support GA for GH passports. It's another standard using JSON Web Tokens for authorization, um, uh, including things called controlled access grants. This is from the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And um, so again, um, it's based on authorization to access scientific research data, in this case, genomics research data. And so we, uh, we issue the passports in that JSON Web Token format. So um, I, just in the, the minute I think I have left, I just want to introduce a couple of questions that we might discuss during the discussion time that are on the mind of the CI Logon team. How do we manage trust when we uh, operate a lot of token issuers? You heard from Manet, we have multiple token issuers for Fermilab. We also have a token issuer for LIGO. So uh, in, the, in the previous worlds, we just operated three certificate authorities. Now it seems like we're going to have 20 plus uh, Chase Web Token token issuers. How do we manage trust in those? How do levels of assurance apply to tokens? It's not just authentication and strength and identity vetting, but also how the tokens are issued, what the, uh, what the inputs are, what the outputs are in the tokens. How do we ensure interoperability? We've uh, had really good results with the IGTF X509 technical profiles for global interoperability. I think WLCG is leading the way here on the JSON Web Token side for um, with their WLCG token profiles. Is that going to be the, the universal token profile? Um, it, it'd be great to have something that's universal. How do we define our threat model? We've got some good inputs. The OAuth threat model, Trusted CIs, OSCRP, and, and others. So if you're interested, I'd, I'd love to have a discussion on that. And uh, lastly, I think we need to make sure we get input from the stakeholders as we're making this transition to tokens. The CL Logon project wants to make sure that all of our subscribers are well represented. And so workshops like this are great. IGTF working group, uh, OSG meeting we just had last week, um, IGTF meetings going forward. So I think we have, we have good opportunities to get that important input. So. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you this morning about CI Logon support for JSON Web Tokens. You can always contact us at help at CILogon.org. Thanks, Jim. Uh, do we have any questions immediately for Jim while his questions are fresh in our minds? I just wanted to add that definitely plus one to talking about how we how we trust these different token issuers that would be a great thing to discuss while we're here absolutely that's certainly i think uh one of the things that we absolutely don't quite have a hard handle on we know we need to do it but we got to figure out how let's look forward to that conversation later i'm sure that'll be a, a light discussion later okay thank you Ru. anything else otherwise we'll let dave get going all right, go ahead, Dave, thank you. All right, so at, at our previous uh, workshop, we, we introduced uh, HTGET token in Vault, and um, that uh, where, where we use Vault to store the OS refresh tokens, and uh, then uh, the Vault issues its own tokens to access those, and Vault takes the place of my proxy in our, in our previous architecture, but it's also the OAuth client that gets shared. Then HTGET token is the Vault client that shares that OAuth client. And we use uh, HTGET token both, both for uh, submitting jobs to HT Condor and, and for direct file transfers. And we want to share that token. So, so that way the, the same user only needs to authenticate once to, to do all whatever operations they need to do. And so, uh, and now the, this talk is about is what we've done more recently, integrating the use of HTGET token and vault into, into HT Condor. 
So uh, what you can do now is counter submit uh, by its, counter submit by itself. It can be configured to call a plugin that uh, that will, and uh, we configured it to automatically invoke htget token as needed, and then that stores a vault token in the Condor CredD service that was already a, a, a part of the HD Condor, and then the the vault token that um, uh, then gets used by Condor Credmon Vault, which is this plugin to Condor CredD, to get new short-lived access tokens that, that and those are pushed then to jobs. So the the vault token that gets get given to Condor CredD is extra long. We give it like four weeks, so that in order it can it can work with jobs that are queued for a long time, and that's also how long we used to store. Uh, used to have uh, proxies live in, in my proxy. So then the submit file, the Condor submit file, you can specify the issuer, the optional role, and then optionally you can choose reduced audience and or scopes. I'll, I'll give you an example of that later. And it may be, uh, it can also be configured to obtain more than one token for each job, maybe, maybe for customized for different purposes. And it's, um, this uh, this mechanism was already implemented also in HD Condor based on their OAuth two credential support directly. So then uh, the vault token is stored also on the submit machine and as well as in Condor CredD, and they are stored so that you can you can have more than one vault token. Uh, if you are if you are a user that uses multiple VOs or multiple roles within a VO, those can all be stored at this, uh, in the same machine. And it's also already available in the, in the current HD Condor versions. So this is the flow that goes through. Uh, you can maybe get a better idea of what's happening. So the user submits, does Condor submit, that calls out to Condor Vault Store, which calls out the htget token, communicates with Vault. Now, the, the first time through, the Vault needs to uh, uh, redirects the user's web browser to go to their to the token issuer and identity provider to authenticate themselves with OAuth. And then that stores that refresh token in Vault. At the same time, the a Vault token gets passed to Condor CredD, and then it calls out to Condor Credmon Vault to get new access tokens from Vault when it needs it, and then passes those, pushes those access tokens onto the to the jobs. So the Condor configuration is uh, is a simple uh, configuration for the system administrator after installing the RPM. And then the user specifies this, these kinds of lines in the, in the config file. So it says use OAuth services and the name of the VO is defined in bulk. And then what kind of uh, scopes they want to put in it and, and the audience or resource. But now this is, those are optional because the faults are already set in vault. And this is only if you want to downgrade their, what scopes you have or uh, set a specific audience. And the, um, the service name can, um, uh, so instead of saying just Dune, it could be Dune underscore production. And so that also adds a role. And then um, you can also independently add multiple, within the same service, you could say for Dune, you can add OAuth promotions. You can have make two different tokens, one for read only and one for write if you want. And they all end up in this uh, directory called uh, that you can access with dollar underscore condor creds. So that's it. And uh, we are short on time, so I think we're going to be skipping. Uh, well, we've been, we've been, uh, yeah. uh, thank you. But, um, we're, we're just going to go ahead, I think, uh, mm -hmm. if uh, you're ready to uh, queue up Hannah's. Yeah, next actually, one. I was thinking we were going to be short, but it looks like we still have 15 minutes, so we should, we should be able to still do Hannah's. We were thinking about skipping uh, Hannah's, but and, uh, yeah, and if we need to bleed a little into the break, that's fine. Okay. And we can, uh, we can move discussion to this afternoon. All right. So if there's a quick question while I'm queuing this up. You can do that. Sure. Um, let's see. Nope. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. We'll go ahead with that. Hi everybody, I'm uh, back for a five minute lightning talk and this time talking about the deployment of WCG IM at CERN. 
So, so far we have, uh, well, three, almost four deployments of WLCG IM. IM standing for Identity Access Management, and this coming from the, the Indigo project, where Andrea Shikanti is the, the main developer and driving force behind it. So we have three instances for Atlas CMS and Alice, and then there's one in progress for LHCB. Uh, so these have to be deployed at CERN for mostly privacy reasons, because otherwise we're not allowed to have access to the uh, the VO member validation through the human resources database. So that's one of the key reasons why we, we are deploying them at CERN rather than in a more distributed fashion, which might have uh, made sense in the past and certainly did for the previous systems. The infrastructure itself, uh, as far as possible, we've tried to leverage CERN's shared computing infrastructure to avoid having anything that's that's particularly custom. So just to, to go through it from, from left to right, we're storing, well, we're, we're pulling Docker images from Docker Hub, and in the future, we're going to actually move those images to CERN and build them build them ourselves and store them there to, to avoid dependencies with the outside world as far as possible. And all of our configuration is stored in CERN's GitLab, and we're using Customize, which is something that Andrea was previously using in other projects, and uh, suits us very well. He's also been working on some shared base config at the moment to make it uh, to avoid having too many dissimilarities between the different deployments that we have for the different experiments. And then we use kubectl to deploy it on the command line, which pushes images, um, which pushes pods, applications, volumes, all the rest of it into OpenShift. So OpenShift, for anyone who doesn't know it, is uh, a platform based on top of Kubernetes. So it's very extensible. You can just keep adding applications to it and it scales very nicely. So we will, at the moment, we just have the production application, which is deployed as, for example, cmsauth.web.cern.ch. In the future, we'll also have a dev instance as well. And we'll make sure that the, the dev infrastructure is properly up and running uh, before we are fully production. Another application that we have running in OpenShift is the HR database. Uh, so that um, is deployed separately, but it's called from the IAM instances. We're pushing logs into some central logs and monitoring services from CERN IT. And we're using the database on demand service as well. So as far as possible, we're trying to use really standard software. And from what we've seen so far, it seems to be working really well. In terms of authentication, the LHC virtual organizations have two login options. There's certificate login, which people will be familiar with, and hopefully in the future we can remove and get them less familiar with, and CERN single sign-on. So the expectation is that the users will authenticate with CERN single sign-on for the initial registration. And then they could add the certificate later if they still have a certificate and if they want to. Um, so the CERN SSO token is what's actually used to validate whether somebody is part of a VO or not. So that's how we establish the link with the identity vetting. And we do, of course, have an additional admin login point, but that's hidden from, from normal users. So for people like Andrea and myself. In terms of support, something that was really important, obviously, to the experiments is that there is some support behind this. It's, it's run as a production service, and that's something that we've set up. So it's, it's being supported by the team where I work, the authentication team in the IT department. There is a 24-7 service task as well, so that, that helps in terms of ticket escalation. Of course, we're working very closely with Andrea, um, and that's been really invaluable. One open point we have is whether the WLCG and CERN security team will need to have direct access to the instances as administrators, or whether we should be providing some kind of blocking API for their usage. And a final word just on trust. So the policy requirements for the token issuers for WLCG are yet to be entirely defined. It's pretty likely that the IDTF will continue to play a crucial role here, and personally, that's what I, I hope happens. The IDTF document on Attribute Authority Operation Guidelines is very useful and I already, already went through this and identified at least a few areas which we needed to change or we need to change in future but currently can't. 
so that's definitely on the horizon of, of what we need to do there to be acknowledged as a, a trusted token issuer for WLCG. So the next steps are to complete the full development infrastructure, ideally automatize as much as possible and tick off all of our production readiness checklists, so more stress tests, instant response procedures and working closely with the security teams for that, monitoring, etc, etc. So that's it from me. Please let me know if you have any questions and many thanks. Thanks for that. Um, any immediate questions? Otherwise, uh, I suggest we move on to Andrea's pre uh, presentation. Okay, go ahead. Okay, can you <clears throat> see my screen? In full screen? Yeah, it looks like we've been, we're looking at the whole desktop. So if you'd rather do the just the window, that's perfect. There you go. Okay. Great. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I will talk to you a bit about uh, Indigo IM status and evolution plans. You already seen uh, in uh, in Hannah's talk how how this has been deployed in support of WCGVOs. I will give uh, more of a status update uh, and uh, uh, details about uh, next development items. Uh, this is the usual. Let me move this something out this is the usual um picture that uh, slide that we use to introduce i am for those who are not familiar uh, this is a, an authentication authorization service that was initially developed during the indigo data cloud project around 2016 15 when we started the objective was to um have a system that would uh, be flexible enough for our future use cases and that could support standard-based authentication authorization, also ensuring backward compatibility with uh, uh, our former system. Basically, this is this can be seen as an evolution of forms towards a more standard-based uh, environment. And uh, basically, uh, uh, this is one of the solutions, and this solution that has been selected by the WCG Management Board for the LHCBOs and uh, for which you have seen how we are deploying it. Uh, and HNFN is committed to its support for the foreseeable future with the help of the projects that I list into this slide. Just a few, very few words, very quick words about what we have been up to recently. Uh, basically, we worked uh, uh, on improving the web presence for the project uh, and also and more importantly improve the, the documentation so you would say you will find in the slides that should be already linked to the agenda a link to the new website and documentation um, we also invested some effort in improving uh, the token exchange flexibility in the software this is quite important from for some of the main token flows that uh, will be used by the experiments and um, in order to have control on actually who can exchange token with whom and uh, which scopes and which authorization attributes can be exchanged between applications. Uh, we added recently support for linking SSH keys to IAM accounts. This is also useful to enable some scenarios where, where IAM access this trusted uh, um, key store and that the other uh, relying parties can depend on to get uh, trusted SSH keys linked to uh, an IAM or virtual organization account. We also, uh, uh, significant work went uh, into the developing this um, VOMS importer script, which is basically uh, uh, has the objective of supporting a seamless migration from VOMS to IAM. This has been deployed at CERN in support of uh, up to now CMS and Atlas. And basically the idea is that we can have the CMS uh, and Atlas IAM instances uh, synced to the POMS services so that we do not force all the users to re-register to the new uh, IAM deployments. If you're interested in more details, you, can, you will get them in the release notes that are also linked in the slides. So what about the future? Of course, there is always uh, bug fixes and things that can be improved. Um, a big area is actually uh, having improved client management and registration. 
uh, we, have, we have seen that the library that we depend on has some scalability issues and usability limits that we want to work around. Another key requirement is actually at the ability to limit uh, um, client registration only to register beyond members. This is, uh, this is something that is very important for uh, production ready deployments, but also the ability to temporarily disable clients or aspire clients that are not used for a certain amount of time. We are also introducing support for job based client authentication. This was discussed last week at the um, WCG authorization working group. And so it's a fairly recent uh, development item, but it's very interesting in that it can provide a more flexible and secure way of um, securing client credentials across our infrastructure. And finally, we have a uh, support for auth resource indicators, which is a standard way to request an audience for tokens. Currently, we are using a, a rather non-standard or a mechanism since when we actually implemented that there was no guidance and support for multi-factor authentication. In general, this basically is a very quick overview. I hope I stayed in time. If you are interested in anything related to IAM, you, 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 in the slides you have the, the references and uh, uh, we will have a, a, a user workshop also um, this year. This will happen in November in a pre-GDB. So if you are interested, you, you feel uh, to come and, and know about how we are doing things, please come and register. We will share the, the information in the usual channels. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Andrea. That's uh, very helpful. Um, we have three minutes on the schedule for uh, discussion. If anybody has any questions that they, they really would like to get out while it's at the top of their head. Please jump in if you, in audio, if you have a question, I'd like to ask. All right. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you thanks for uh, putting all of these together so quickly and, and, uh, managing to fit it in your allotted time. I appreciate that. Uh, it's always hard to be first and not run late because people get excited about what you speak of. And then um, we have a tendency to, to push things back. So with that in mind, um, I will try to get back to the schedule we have uh, and make sure that we know who's next. Uh, we have uh, on the uh, agenda, here, uh, let's see, we have Rich Cardone, Sean Cleveland, and Joe Stubbs coming up to speak to us about tokens in the Tapas API platform. Uh, you guys ready to present? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll stop my share if you'll take over and drive. All right, can everyone see this? Looks good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everyone for having us. Um, we're going to talk about um, the Tapas tokens and how um, Tapas leverages JSON web tokens. So um, today um, we're going to have, you're going to hear from uh, Joe Stubbs. He's the PI on the Tapas project. Um, he's at the University of Texas Austin and the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, Rich Cardone, he's one of the uh, lead developers on the Tapas project and uh, with some of the security kernel stuff that you'll hear about today. He's also at UT Austin and TAC. And uh, my name is Sean Cleveland. I'm at the University of Hawaii. I'm one of the co-PIs on the Tapas project. And so just get right in. So today we'll cover a little bit of background on Tapas, as well as some of the, uh, the major use cases that we have for JSON web tokens. Um, some of the components of the security architecture with Tapas and how um, tokens are issued and, and managed and um, like everything in there. And then finally, we'll cover some of the challenges of using tokens um, within Tapas. So I'm going to hit some of the background. So I'll hit a little background on Tapas, um, the major services that we have, some of the services that we use to support um, uh, scientific workflow execution. So the data management, the code execution um, services, and then I'll hit two major use cases that we sort of have. So. 
So what is Tapas? Uh, if you're not familiar, Tapas is been around for a while, um, but we're currently in a five year NSF funded uh, framework grant. So Tapas is sort of a platform as a service. Um, we have a bunch of microservice APIs to support science. So we're kind of like a middleware um, that a number of science gateways are built off and people write um, copy or write software so that they can run their computational workflows and span um, multiple multiple sites um, to run their research. Um, currently, um, it's used to manage data and execute code across a lot of um, high performance computing clusters, high throughput um, computing and some commercial and cloud systems. Um, in the 2020 to 2021 year, we had about 51,000 researcher active accounts uh, within Tapas. Um, we had about 23 tenants and 15 gateways that were sort of leveraging uh, these services. So Tapas uh, is agentless, so it uses an SSH-based communication to talk to the, um, the storage and the computational compute systems uh, that I discussed um, to, to gain access and stage data, do jobs, and that sort of thing. Um, it is implemented, as I mentioned, as a microservice. So each service has a number of, of REST uh, interfaces, and we use open API specs to essentially uh, define those contracts. And then finally, users, uh, they obtained a token by authenticating to Tapas using OAuth2, and then those tokens are essentially used to talk to the different services. Um, if you want more information, you can go to tapas-project.org to see some more. Um, so Tapas services, there's kind of four major areas that they fall into. So we kind of have tenancy, authentication, and security are some of the where the services live. Um, metadata management so that we can track um, information about any of the objects in the system. Uh, the data management and code execution, which we'll talk a little bit more about and we'll be talking about throughout this presentation. And then finally, um, streaming data, events, and uh, function support. Um, so those are all the major services within Tapas. And if you're interested, you can find, uh, find our live docs off of our, our project.org page. So, um, so one of the big things that uh, folks wanna do is manage their data and uh, run computation. And so in the little diagram, um, the user can leverage Tapas to essentially you know, run those workflows on HPC systems, HTC, and cloud systems. And in order to do that, they have to um, use four of the, uh, the main services within Tapas. So what do these services do? So the system service here, essentially, you're able to register your storage and your execution system um, definitions. So you know what, what, what host is this? What ports? Um, what are the credentials being used? That sort of thing um, are all stored within sort of the system service um, view here. Then the files service manages the ingestion movement and the transformation of files and folders. So um, you know, it handles it handles moving moving the data, staging it in, moving it out, like when, when jobs are being run. The app service, this essentially um, stores the information um, that you register your, your application container that you're going to run on any of these systems, um, such as the inputs and all the parameters and uh, that sort of thing. And then finally, the job service, this handles essentially launching a job. So it combines the other three APIs we just talked about. So taking the app, um, staging it to um, one of the, the, the computational systems using the, the file service and transferring the data and doing all that. In addition, jobs also captures the, you know, the full provenance of the, the job cycle, so capturing all the metadata and the workflow. So with sort of that background, um, one of the major uh, use cases that we have is service-to-service -service requests. So um, Tapas has to make authenticated requests between the different services on behalf of the users. So using the services we kind of just mentioned, I'll sort of walk through a use case here. So if a user wants to submit a, a computational job, they'll hit the jobs API service. So assuming they're already authenticated, they we're gonna essentially do say, move some input files from the compute to a compute system. So jobs is gonna do that. So the user makes a request to the job service. Jobs talks to a security kernel service. You'll hear a little more about that, but essentially this is where the permissions are. So jobs checks the permissions for the user um, those are all good. So then it can talk to the files API to essentially say, let's um, initiate this data transfer with some of these files to a storage system. So files has to talk to the system's API to get the definition of, you know, how do I connect to that system? Where is it at? Um, and what protocol can I use to move this data? So service to service requests, that's one of our major um, use cases here. So the second one here is where you have cross-site services. So in this case, we have essentially two Tapas instances um, at separate sites. So 
Um, we have one at the University of Hawaii, and then we have another one here at the Texas Advanced Compute Center. And this is actually a real use case because we have a deployment at UH and the central deployment, the primary one is at TAC. So in this case, the services have to talk across sites um, using um, some sort of you know, authenticated service. And this is what we're leveraging JSON Web Tokens for. So again, we're going to submit a job. So um, just like before, user submits the request to the job service. It checks the permissions at the University of Hawaii site to say, can the user do this? Um, can they access this system and run this application? They can, so it again talks to the files API service. So files at this point is going to get the system definition, but it's going to ask at this point for the one that's at TAC. So now we have cross-site um, requests happening here. So um, previously, um, when it was within the same instance, we would just, you know, the file service was already authenticated, but there's an extra step that has to take place here in which the systems API at TAC needs to talk to its security kernel and says, hey, is this user authenticated and it's UH authenticated to be able to make this, uh, this, this request? So we sort of have this federated um, trust that's going on here. So those are kind of the major use cases and a little bit of the background on Capus. So I'm going to actually hand it over to Rich to talk a little bit about the components here. So I'm gonna stop my share. Yes, uh, see, let me just get set up here. Uh, let's see. Sorry for the delay. My name is uh, Rich Cardone, and I think you should be able to see the screen now. So uh, I'm going to introduce the components of the uh, security architecture. Uh, we'll begin with uh, just the concept of tenancy in Tapis, and then we'll move on to talk a little bit more about multi-site support or cross-site support that Sean mentioned. Uh, then we'll delve into the 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 three main uh, microservices that implement our security architecture. And then we'll take a peek inside of uh, the Tapis JWT. So tenancy in Tapis is, is just a way that we logically isolate uh, views of the system for different user groups. Uh, these user groups typically are uh, people in the same project or those that use the same uh, portal uh, to access the system. Every tenant is owned by a site, and a site can have one or more tenants. The tenant service provides a registry of all tenants in site on the whole platform. So there's only a single tenants instance running at the primary site in any instance of the Tapas platform. Every tenant has its own uh, JWT signing key pair, and uh, the tenants public keys are accessible via the tenants API. Uh, without authentication, they're, they're pu it's public knowledge. Uh, Tapas uh, provides multi-site support using a hub and spoke communication model. So the graphic on the right shows a primary site and then a number of satellite sites that we call associate sites that communicate with the primary site. Um, pri uh, associate sites can uh, communicate within themselves and communicate with the primary site, but they don't communicate with each other. The reason you might uh, want to uh, deploy an associate site is to gain uh, greater local control of various aspects of Tapas without incurring the full overhead of installing uh, the, the full platform. So uh, the, the first aspect of, of local control would be identity and access management. You can use your own LDAP or user stores for uh, credentials checking. Uh, and you can actually, you can use the default authenticator that comes with Tapas, or you can install your own authenticator uh, that, that, you know, your legacy authenticator or one that is customized for your own needs. The second, second access aspect of local control is that of keeping secrets local. Uh, we, you, we, you have the ability to have all secrets and keys stored on your local site and not have them leave your local site. And finally, you can you can um, you can configure the services that you want deployed at your site. And typically, this would be done. Uh, besides the security reasons, you'll do it for uh, improving data locality. If you have large databases, you may uh, move the execution that the execution the microservices that use those databases to your site and uh, improve performance. And finally, you can extend Tapas by adding your own custom services that are not part of 
you know, the basic platform. Uh, an important point to note is that all requests to services that don't run at your associate site get routed to the primary site. So it should be transparent to users uh, when, they, when they make requests. So here's an example of a different way of looking at what uh, Sean already showed you uh, as far as the, the two sites that we currently have. We have TAC on the right as the primary site, and we have University of Hawaii running an associate site. And you can see in the Kubernetes cluster in, in the University of Hawaii site, there's the authenticator, a security kernel, and the tokens. Those are the security components. Uh, those are microservices. And in addition, we have the meta and streams microservice, and those are running at uh, locally at the University of Hawaii, because that's where the data is. When a user makes a request, if they make a request to one of those uh, services, the, the request stays local. But if it's to uh, other services, say jobs or files that we've already talked about, those would get routed to the primary site. So let's take a look a little bit more about the, the actual microservices that implement these uh, security, the security architecture. The authenticators basically implement a login function, uh, you know, for uh, for users by interacting with an identity provider, an IDP. So typically, the IDPs are external to Tapas, such as an institution's um, LDAP server. Each tenant can have its own authenticator and IDP. And authenticator interacts with the token service or tokens issuer uh, to acquire JWTs for users. The way this works is that the Authenticator calls the IDP to validate the user credentials, and if successful, the authenticator calls tokens to create a new uh, Tapas JWT for the user. The token service really has only one job, and that is to create and sign JWTs. Uh, it uses tenant-specific signing keys uh, to sign the JWT, and it loads these keys from the security kernel of startup. Only the token service can access uh, those signing keys. Authenticators, you know, we've already mentioned that authenticators validate the user credentials, and when they request uh, when they request a token from JWT, they get what we call a user token. Services, on the other hand, authenticate with a service password. Uh, passwords are injected into services at startup, and uh, the service then passes that password to tokens uh, when when they when they start up. And tokens calls the security kernel to validate that password. Uh, tokens creates, uh, I mean, tokens then creates a refreshable service JWT if the uh, password validates. Our security kernel has two jobs. It's a, uh, it manages secrets and it authorizes data. It, 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 it uh, does uh, roles and permissions. So we use a uh, HashiCorp vault for secret management. And we extended the Apache Shiro base roles and permissions for our permission checking. Uh, every site runs a security kernel and uh, only local services can access the local security kernel. The security kernel uh, maintains the public private keys used for signing and verifying tokens. And the keys for the signing keys for tenants owned by this site are the only uh, signing keys at that site. So to more or less to, to, to summarize, every site runs its own authenticators, tokens, and security kernel services. And services at that site can only interact with their local tokens and security, uh, security kernel. We can take a look at those flows uh, pictorially by just noting that uh, how, how a user would use their credentials to get it to get a token. They would pass their credentials to the authenticator. The authenticator would validate them through an IDP, which is not shown. And on success, uh, the authenticator makes a check, uh, makes a request to tokens. Tokens checks with the security kernel that that authenticator has the correct role for, for making that request. If so, a user JWT is passed back to the authenticator and then passed to the user. Services on the other hand would start up pass their service password to tokens. Tokens would ask the security kernel, uh, is this a valid password? If so, a service, a refreshable service JWT gets passed back to services. So at this point, you can take a peek into uh, what a Tapas JWT looks like. So first of all, it's passed uh, on all calls 
uh, in the X tapest token header on REST calls. It contains the standard JWT claims and some custom tactics claims. Uh, the most pertinent here are the four high, the first four highlighted uh, claims. The, uh, the token type, the Tapas token type is either a refresh or a, an access token. The account type is either a user or service as we've been talking about. The site ID uh, notes the, the site where the token was created and the target site ID is the only site for, at which the token is valid. So that, that's pretty much uh, wraps up this, a summary of, our, uh, of the components that implement uh, the JWTs. Uh, for Tapas. Uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Joe at this point. Let me make sure I can uh, stop sharing. Uh, let's see, I'm having trouble stopping sharing. This has happened before. So if somebody can kick me off, that'd be great. Yeah, it looks like I can't kick you off. There we go. Uh, cool. All right. All right, let me share my screen. Cool, so hopefully everybody can, can see that. So um, yeah, thanks Sean and Rich for setting that up. We thought we would close the, the end of the talk uh, by discussing some of the challenges um, that we faced uh, in, in Tapas, specifically uh, regarding tokens. Um, so we'll talk about three, the, the, these first three things that we feel like we've kind of solved today. Um, something we call on behalf of uh, data transmission, and then how we both send and receive uh, service requests. And then the last two, uh, cross-site resource access and dynamic authentication, we will um, kind of end with. These are sort of things we haven't solved, uh, but they're, they're sort of future work things, things we're interested in um, hearing from the community about. So we'll begin with uh, on behalf of request data. So the context here, right, is that a service needs to make a request to another service. Uh, and when it does that, it always provides its own service JSON web token to authenticate. However, um, there's this challenge that we need to preserve the identity of the original user that has made the request to the service in the first place. So our solution here is, um, is pretty simple. We use uh, a couple of specific headers. Uh, namely the XTAPIS tenant and the XTAPIS user header to transmit, to transmit the original user's um, identity throughout the request flow. So we have a user, um, they let's say make a request to the files API to list some files. They're gonna of course uh, provide their own JSON web token that's going to be validated. Um, but the first thing the files API is going to do um, is they're going to make a request to the security kernel to say, does this user um, you know, is this user authorized to list these files? So when Files API calls security kernel, it's going to provide its own JSON web token, but it's going to uh, pass the user's identity information, uh, both the username and the tenant that they live in um, through these two headers. So assuming the security kernel um, says, yes, uh, they are authorized to do that, um, the file service is then going to make a call to the system service, as you've seen before, um, in, in what uh, Rich and Sean both said, um, to, to, to get the actual system description, um, including the credential to use to access, uh, to access the system. So again, files will pass its own JSON web token, um, but it will pass the, the original requester's identity information through these two headers. Uh, and similarly, systems will uh, call security kernel to, to actually retrieve that credential, um, and it will pass its own uh, JSON web token as well as these, these on behalf of headers. So finally, after all of that flow, uh, we have the credential and Tapas is able to SSH to the actual system as the user um, and do the file listing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here we'll talk about um, sending a service to service request. So um, again, we'll continue on with the example from the previous slide, um, but here we're going to do a twist, a slight twist on it. We're going to put files at the University of Hawaii associate site um, and systems at the primary site. So, so in this case, um, we're in a situation where uh, you know the, the user will make a request in the, the the University of Hawaii tenant to the files API, um, but but the the University of Hawaii is not running the systems API. So when files uh, makes a request to systems, um, it must do so uh, to the primary site. Um, 
So the first thing that's going to happen is um, that when all the Tapas services uh, initialize, when they when they first start up, they make uh, requests to our sites and tenants APIs. These are actually public records uh, accessible without authentication. Uh, they store a fair amount of information about the sites and the tenants um, that have been registered with Tapas. Um, but, but two important pieces of, of information that they provide are uh, the public keys um, that are used, um, uh, the, corresponding to the private keys that are used to sign all the JSON web tokens, as well as all of the APIs, all of the actual services that are running at the specific sites. So in particular, um, when the files and the systems and every other type of service starts up, they're going to retrieve this data um, and kind of cache it, cache it locally. Okay, so, so once that has taken place, at some point in the future, we have our user and they make a request to the files API. So at this point, files knows that it needs to call systems. Um, and the first thing it's going to do is it's going to check, is systems running um, at my site? Um, it knows that it's not because it has this information about, uh, about the sites and the, and the services that they run. And so it knows that it then needs to call systems API uh, running at the, at the tax site. So in order to do that, um, it's going to provide the, the JSON web token uh, that represents itself uh, with a target site equal to TAC. So it's going to have these two JSON web tokens, one with a target site uh, of UH and another with a target site of TAC. But because it's targeting the system service running at the primary site at TAC, it's going to use that JSON web token um, to, to make the, uh, the HTTP request. And then uh, the, the rest proceeds as as in the previous slide, and, and eventually uh, files obtains the credential and SSHs to the system. Here is the, the full algorithm um, for sending service to service requests. I won't go through all the details, uh, but I'll just kind of mention that there are some special cases, right? So um, we only have one uh, instance of the tenants API and it's running at the primary site. Um, so that's a special case. If, if you're making a service request to the tenants API, you always use the primary site. And, and similarly, um, if you're talking to the security kernel or, or the token issuer, um, you always do that um, through the services running at your local site. Okay, so um, that's sending service to service requests. Uh, so how about the other end, validating service to service requests? So again, um, we're gonna continue with, with our example um, and, and we have systems API has received this request uh, from files and it needs to, to validate that uh, it should be actually handling that request. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to decode uh, the JSON web token and it's going to retrieve uh, the, the target site ID claim. Now systems API, like every other Tapas API, was started up with a configuration that included the site where it is running. And, and so um, the systems API knows it's running at the TAC site. And so it's going to check, does the target site ID claim match my site? Um, and if it doesn't, it's going to reject it directly. Um, but since they do match, it will, it will proceed. So, so the next thing it's going to do is it's going to check the, the tenant ID claim. Um, in this case, we have a value of UH main. That's to say that our user um, was in the UH main tenant. And it's gonna figure out which site owns that UH main tenant. Um, in this case, uh, it's, it's the UH site. And, um, and so from that, it can check, does the UH site actually run the system's API? Because if it does, I should, I should reject this request. I, 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 should, I should force files to use that, that local instance of, of systems. Since it doesn't, uh, systems knows that um, since it's running at the primary site, it should accept uh, the request. And essentially, the rest uh, proceeds as with the uh, as with the other slides. Um, so again, uh, this is the full algorithm for uh, service request validation. Uh, again, there are some special cases analogous to um, the special cases that I mentioned on the on the earlier slides, such as whether or not it's the tenants API or or the to or the tokens or the security kernel API. Um, but but otherwise, yeah, it's it's similar to what we've we've described in the in the pictures. All right, so we thought we would conclude um, with a couple of problems that we're, we're still actively trying to work on. We're trying to, to solve these problems. Uh, you know, we're definitely interested in uh, community thoughts and, and feedback on, on these. 
we have some ideas, uh, but, but by no means a complete solution. So the first one um, is what we refer to as cross-site resource utilization. And, and so the idea here is that um, within a single Tapas tenant, uh, users would be able to access systems both at the primary site and at the associate site uh, without sharing secrets beyond the site where the system is physically located. Um, so, you know, today that's not quite possible. Um, essentially, today what, what folks can do is they can either exclusively use systems at their own site, for example, the, the University of Hawaii associate site, or uh, they can use a mix of systems at both sites uh, but they must share credentials, uh, the, the SSH access um, basically, uh, with TAC, uh, with the primary site in order to, to achieve this. The challenges really are around SSH access first. So um, restricted SSH access policies around um, SSH access, including multi-factor auth at the various sites. Uh, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is the multiple identities that we have floating around in this in this scenario, right? So we have our user um, who has an identity with uh, the local site IDP, um, and that's one identity, but that's really a completely decoupled identity from the identity that that same person may actually own at some other site. Um, so we have to be able to reconcile these identities. So, so some of the approaches that we've, we've looked at, some of the ingredients we see um, as part of the solution, First, we're gonna to need to be able to route uh, TAPIS requests uh, to systems or to you know, actions that involve accessing systems to the site where the system physically resides. And that's, that's slightly different from what we do today where basically um, you know, we just determine whether the, the site uh, runs the, uh, an instance of the service or not. Um, second, we're going to have to be able to arrange it so that authorization and secrets data uh, residing in the security kernel are available at the target site where the system resides. And that's also, again, not true today. So there's two pieces to this. First, the authorization data. Um, we're looking at potentially mirroring that across sites. Um, and then second, actually, the secrets data. So we're going to have to arrange it so that uh, the, the, the secrets data are actually stored at the target site where the system resides. And again, that's gonna take something new. Um, of course, we need to do this identity mapping uh, and reconciliation because we've got these multiple identities. Um, we're looking at something like in common federation for that. Um, and we've also been looking at Globus, um, Globus auth, as well as the, uh, the Globus transfer. We, we see this as potentially, uh, again, uh, an ingredient at least for, for some of it. We, we, we can't get job submission most likely through Globus, uh, but, but the file transfer uh, and the auth pieces um, will, will likely be useful. So last, we'll talk about dynamic authentication. Um, and here, what we mean, the goal is essentially to enable users to grant direct SSH access to Tapas without having to manage system credentials. Um, that's really our goal. Uh, today, you know, we don't have that. Uh, essentially, when a user registers a system with Tapas, uh, they provide it with an SSH key as part of the system definition. And then they have to go back behind the scenes and ensure that the, the physical system uh, honors that credential, you know, essentially putting a, a public key um, in an authorized keys file. Um, there's also a way to use service accounts, uh, but that's discouraged uh, for obvious reasons. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, so what are the challenges with dynamic authentication? Essentially, we need to be able to establish trust with Tapas and, and the actual physical system. Um, and so, uh, you know, ultimately what we want is to be able to issue uh, short-term credentials on the fly by trusted components. And uh, we've looked at two approaches to this really, um, you know, the same approach, two sides of the same coin. Um, we, you know, our, our HashiCorp vault, which we're already running, um, can, can, you, can uh, run a certificate authority, which can issue short-lived X509 certificates, um, <clears throat> which Tapas could then use to, to, uh, to SSH in. Of course, the, the system would have to actually honor uh, the CA in order for that to work. Um, and then similarly, we've looked at using side tokens uh, to create these short-lived tokens. 
Um, and, and again, similarly, the systems would have to trust the side token issuer. Um, so we've looked at, um, you know, the, the SSH OAuth uh, module um, with the side token support um, as a potential um, ingredient there. Okay, and so with that, I think uh, we'll end. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are a few questions that cropped up in chat. Um, those of you who asked, go ahead and ask your own question so I don't screw it up. Sure. Um, I'll I'll bite, uh, sir. I had to write them in the chat so I wouldn't forget. Uh, I've only had one or two cups of coffee today. Um, and I think this kind of might dovetail with what Dave asked. Uh, so when users interact with the, the Tapas APIs, uh, how are how, how precisely are they they getting the token from the service to the user? Is 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 it a uh, OAuth based? Is it a, a custom distribution method? Um, you know, they, they've asked whether it's command line versus you know a rich uh, uh, interface like a browser. How how does that link work? Sure. Yeah. Those are those are great questions. Thanks. So um, it, it's uh, it is OAuth based. Um, it is all of the above. So we you know we support um, you know the various OAuth two flows. Um, so so we support uh, folks getting a token through the browser. Um, and, and we also have uh, support for command lines as well. So we have folks kind of coming in at all different layers uh, and, you know, and, um, and yeah, it, it, but it, but at the end of the day, it's always OAuth too. So, so one thing that, that came up, I think in Hannah's talk, um, she hinted at it was, you know, uh, the, the command line flows for, or say the device flow are, are still a little bit uh, painful. Do you have a preferred client you're happy with or are you using something custom for command line tools or, or yeah. are you not using the device flow at all? <laughs> we're, we're not using the device flow yet. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have actually talked about adding device flow. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we you know, have, too big of concerns with it, um, but yeah, right now um, we we don't have support for the device flow yet. So, is your command line client a custom one, or are you using somebody else's command line client for that? No, yeah, uh, well, yeah. So, so all of our SDKs and, and CLIs are uh, not necessarily written by the the Tapas core team, but they are. Um, uh, they are developed uh, by the community. Um, on top of uh, right now, the the basic uh, technique is to to develop them on top of the uh, um, the OpenID or not OpenID the uh, the Swagger two spec, um, and so yeah, so they're 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 based on top of the the specifications, the API specifications, and um, and they are sort of you know, I mean they're, they're built on top of libraries, but they are essentially custom. Uh, the the auth piece in particular, right, uh, is is essentially custom. So so how is uh, authentication, user authentication implemented on the command line? Do you require the user to have a browser to drive the flow, or is just uh, the user that answer a username and a password in uh, from the client itself? Yep, there there is essentially two essentially two ways. One is uh, to to provide the password directly. Um, the other is to open a browser. Yeah, so we have a we have an application that can essentially walk the uh, the auth to you know authorization code grant uh, in the browser for them, and the device can can essentially defer to that, or it can um, it can collect the password directly. Yeah. Okay, so that would be the resource owner password credential. That's right. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. So then. Yeah, I was also very interested in your in your use of Vault since we're also using that. You're not use you're just you're using anything custom with Vault or is it just the standard Kerberos support of Vault? Uh, yeah, with Vault we're using the um, what is it the app role? Uh, let's see, uh, the app role authentication method, and we we haven't we we yeah that's pretty much it. Um, we also use, let's see, what's the other thing that we use? Uh, authentication method. 
um, but I think that's basically it. Uh -huh. So you haven't, so you haven't like written or modified any plugins or, or, or do you have any like configuration program scripts that you support for, for Vault or is it just, is it just, just in the, in the in instructions to tell people what to plug in? No, it's so Vault is hidden behind the security kernel in Tapas. Mm -hmm. So nobody actually, there is no access, users have no direct access to Vault. So or administrators even administrators yes so there's so we've we've written some like for instance since we're using the open source version of vault you know we we wrote um, backup routines um and yes there are we have administrative uh, initialization so to initialize vault with the tapas uh you know certain tapas secrets and roles and uh so that's all that's all scripted um, but that's internal to, you know, to Tapas. Users don't see that directly. You're not using the, the, the OIDC plugin of Vault. No, no. That's what we're using. Yeah, there are lots of, there's, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, things to explore in Vault. We were just happy to get it up and keep it running, uh, to be honest with you. Um, we really don't want to lose our secrets. So we spend a lot of time trying to just make sure that uh, we have a way of backing up uh, secrets while it's running, you know, so it's, uh, so that's, that's where we spend most of our time. Hey, Brian, the first question I didn't hear you at, your first question I didn't hear you at, ask, which I'm also interested in is, uh, right. You're not using the, the OS2 standard metadata discovery to, to, to find the uh, public keys. You're using a uh, Tapas API for that instead? Yeah, we are. It's, it's they're they're attached to the tenant right now. Um I, I think I think um I think supporting the standard is a good thing to do. Is it, you know it's the right thing to do, but the, the services will likely continue to to use the tenants API um because there because it's it's you know it's a part of what they need to do part of their business logic or their initialization logic is to to gather all that data um at, at initialization time so i think it it'll be a convenient way uh, for that to continue to proceed but yes um using the standard is is good you know once we have actual external services that are that are needing to be written and and uh, and consume this stuff. Uh, we don't really have those, honestly, right at the moment. Um, everything is is internally written. Um, you know, we'll, we will will be forced to adhere more to the to the specs of some of these things. So, so since you mentioned uh, external services, do you actually have any uh, Condor-based backends right now? Uh, the, the, reason, the reason I thought or was thinking about that is that's actually a uh, something that's external that that could use the JWTs directly for for job submission, um, which would maybe be a nice kind of end in demo. But I, I don't know if that's a active backend for you guys. Yeah, we don't. I don't believe we have that backend uh, uh, right now. Uh, we, but yes, you're exactly right. That would be uh, that would be a, a great example of something that that could use that for sure. Yeah, we we one of the things we didn't really talk about is that um, you know the presentation was really about the Tapas V3, the, so kind of our version three of the platform. We we didn't really we didn't want to go into all the details, but that's a fairly new uh, a new ins, a new you know kind of a, a not a full rewrite, but uh, but it's a all new services, all new uh, service uh, contracts. Um, the V2 version of the platform, which um, you know was production you know, initial production release circa 2015. Um, did have some uh, did have support for for Condor backend. Um, did have some support for that. Um, so yeah, we're we're kind of in the process of of migrating some functionality uh, from from V two to V three. We have kind of an initial set of of functionality that's that's enough to get jobs running. You know, get jobs running at TAC at, at you know at a lot of um, you know uh, exceed sites, but but. Um, but yeah, we still have a lot of functionality in V2 that hasn't been ported in.
Great, thank you. Um, we're right at 11.30, uh, which is our designated break time. Um, does anybody have any questions that are burning that they'd like to ask now, or should we take our pause and stay on schedule? Okay, going once, going twice. Uh, by all means, if you think of something, you know, write it down and bring it back to our discussion session for this afternoon. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and plenty of things that people will think of afterwards as we're inspired by other speakers. Um, so thank you uh, to this morning's um, uh, speakers, and uh, we look forward to um, engaging you and others in the conversation as we go forward. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break um, and reconvene. Um, let's see here at, well, it's uh, 1140 my time. Um, I believe this is the correct chair here. And uh, at 1140, we'll have uh, Dimitri Mission uh, come in and talk to us about uh, using CI log on OIDC with um, Kubernetes. So um, we'll see you in about, well, nine minutes now since I've been jabbering on. Uh, please come back in, uh, at 1140 Eastern. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, then, uh, welcome back, folks. Um, Dima, if you'd like to go ahead and get started. Okay, hello, everyone. I'm Dima Mission uh, from the University of California, San Diego, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, and uh, Kelly T2. And uh, I'm the admin and uh, lead developer for Nautilus, the global Kubernetes cluster that spans across multiple uh, universities in the US and some uh, internationally. And today I will talk about how we do authentication for users in our Kubernetes cluster. So the problem is that uh, we want to provide, uh, so basically this cluster uh, is what we called uh, potluck supercomputing. Uh, different universities can donate hardware to the cluster. Basically, they attach the nodes, and we want to provide uh, free access to those all those uh, computing resources to a bunch of uh, scientists from different universities and do it as easy as possible for them. And the um, main idea is that Kubernetes uh, accepts uh, JWT tokens uh, out of the box, so we don't need to do any magic. Uh, users can uh, get to, uh, ID token and refresh token, uh, and then uh, they just uh, feed these tokens to kubectl. And kubectl is the main uh, command line tool to uh, deal with uh, Kubernetes API server. So basically, we put this in kubectl config. Uh, kubectl feeds this token to Kubernetes API server. 
uh, API server is checking whether GWT signature is valid, uh, whether it expired, whether user is authorized to use the service, and then user can just do uh, whatever he needs to do in the Kubernetes API server. Uh, so first, uh, where we use uh, CI local is user's authentication in the user portal. Uh, user portal started as just a simple uh, one call uh, web service. Basically, user will come get the config file and that's it. But then it evolved into a big uh, portal that does a bunch of stuff. And uh, user authenticating in that portal is the first uh, thing what they see. And then once they're authenticated, they can get the config file. And uh, with this config file, they can authenticate against the Kubernetes API server. And since users are already familiar with uh, CI logon after this, we use CI logon uh, everywhere we can. Uh, right now, uh, it's, there is a bunch of Jupyter hubs deployed in our cluster. And the easiest way to, again, enable authentication for users is by using CI logon. And we have a number of uh, other different web applications that can uh, use OIDC and CI logon. Uh, it's Nextcloud, GitLab service, and there are a couple others. So basically, everywhere we can, in every tool that supports OIDC, we just enable OIDC through CI logon so that users use the same uh, account for everything. But those all those services uh, have different users databases. So if users authenticate to portal, it doesn't mean they automatically get account in, let's say, GitLab. So they need to re-authenticate again. So client registration in uh, CI logon, uh, when we register a client, it provides an option for either confidential or public uh, client. And that's what enables us to uh, make this uh, kubectl refreshing token service. Uh, so basically, we give a confidential uh, client. So, so both clients are. Uh, enabled in the portal. And when user first authenticates with the portal, uh, user is using confidential client. And uh, this client provides user's email, uh, user's name. Uh, so basically all information we need uh, to store in our database in the portal. But once user is requesting the uh, config file for kubectl, the portal at that point is using the public client. And public means that we can give the client uh, ID and secret to the user, to all users in the cluster. But uh, both clients, of course, return the same user ID uh, for the user. And that's how we match the uh, config file with the user's account. So how it works, uh, user is logging in with the confidential client. Uh, then user clicks a button, get a, give me the config file, and user is authenticated again against CI logon. So he goes again through OIDC process and then uh, gets the generated config file with the API uh, server IP and uh, all this information like JWT token and uh, client ID and secret. And then uh, portal is the thing that uh, manages all user permissions in the cluster. So basically, a portal will uh, through portal user can create a namespace. Uh, in that namespace, portal will set users uh, permissions uh, to manage the namespace and do uh, all kinds of stuff. And also through the portal, users can add additional users uh, to the namespace. So they can do it directly because now they are uh, owners of the namespace, but it's easier for them to not uh, mess with the back permissions and they just click on the portal. Okay, there's another user who also authenticated to the portal using uh, CI logon. 
and please add this user to the namespace. And the portal will add the CI logon ID to this namespace again as the owner of the namespace. Uh, so when they click, uh, click create new namespace, uh, portal verifies that this namespace doesn't exist. If it doesn't, then it sets all this uh, stuff for the user. Um, so in kubectl config, uh, there is a section uh, regarding the user. Uh, basically, it's saying it's auth provider. Uh, and this is what user is getting from the uh, portal when they ask for a config. So basically, they get client ID and secret, and these are the public ones. And then ID token, uh, URL, and refresh token. And this refresh token allows uh, kubectl to refresh the uh, token for user. And then Kubernetes API server, it's basically the URL. Uh, ID, the client ID to match, and then the username prefix. We don't use any uh, prefix here, so it's just the dash. Uh, what problems we see uh, with this? Uh, users, as I said, are authenticated twice. Uh, first, when they log in into the portal, and second time when they get the config. And often we see that user, uh, so in um, UCSD, uh, a bunch of accounts are served through Google and users might remember first time to click uh, UCSD in CI logon, but when they get the config, they, <laughs> they're probably already annoyed that they should do it twice and they just go with default Google. And default Google will still redirect them to uh, UCSD uh, AD page. And for us, that, those are two different accounts. So we see that, that user logged in as a UCSD account, and then they get a different ID as Google account. And then they come and they ask, oh, uh, like uh, my, my portal says that I'm a user in a, a cluster, but then I try to use kubectl and uh, it tells me I'm not authenticated Why? So they still need to remember that they should go through the same uh, provider. And also kubectl, um, because it refreshes the token, it has to be accessed only from a single uh, instance. So basically user has to uh, run only one kubectl in parallel. And users tend to run kubectl through some uh, automated scripts, like to pull the status from the cluster. And that's where it breaks because uh, several kubectls try to refresh the token in parallel. And for, our, for the last one, it breaks because first one is already in the process and then second one uh, tries to do it. And then first one succeeds, but then second one rewrites the refresh token with some new one and basically it breaks the whole workflow. And then uh, sometimes we see uh, always a DDoS attack on CI logon because kubectl like tries to refresh it in, in a loop. And so it's sending like hundreds of requests or sometimes it's some other library even, uh, I think. So users just feed this, um, config file to some uh, library that knows how to deal with uh, Kubernetes API and this library is trying to refresh it in a loop where, uh, and it's already broken like this refresh token is not valid and so CI logon now uh, automatically bans those IPs and like users need to send them email and say okay uh, I fixed my problem and what, what we recommend, and it's in our documentation, is if user is using it in an automated way, then they should use service accounts in the cluster. So not the uh, OIDC workflow. But they need to read documentation to see that. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, Ima. Um any immediate questions from our demo on this? If not, um, yeah, I had a quick go ahead. 
Yeah. Uh, so, so Dima, have, have you ever seen um, the the Dex identity provider for for Kubernetes? Dex uh, is that? Yeah, I know there are several OIDC provide. Is, is that a OIDC provider or something else? Yeah. So it it's um, gosh, I almost think of it a bit like an OIDC proxy. Uh, you you can. Uh, it, 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 it will be an OADC provider uh, and it's meant to help uh, you bootstrap Kubernetes auth. So it does several cute things in terms of generates commands people can copy paste on Windows, Mac or Linux uh, to, to set up kube control. Uh, but it, in order to authenticate to the OIDC, OIDC provider, it can then have a number of its own authentication plugins. So I've uh, I've seen at Chicago where they were able to uh, have a local DEX instance uh, require CI logon authentication. So mm -hmm. you CI logon to log into DEX, you get the uh, access token, the refresh token from DEX, and then that goes into Kube control. And you know, just listening to you talk about some of the uh, DDoS issues with, with CI logon, you know, it made me think that perhaps having kind of a intermediate uh, uh, provider there could help avoid pushing some of that load out to CI logon. I see an index, it like creates groups of users. Um, I, I think it doesn't really create its own groups. It just depends on whatever the authentication plugin is. So if you had a CI logon built group, uh, then you can then it will pass through some of that. Uh, but that's where my understanding of the application gets a little more theoretical. But, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I'll look. Thank you. Yeah. Um, All right, I, I, did, I did have a group question. So you mentioned namespaces and users and in the custom portal, you can add users to a, a, a Nautilus namespace. Mm -hmm. Is that done through a uh, like custom application installing RBAX, or is it done by giving tokens with with groups? Yes, that's the application setting up all RBAX rules for the users. Okay. So basically, this portal is managing all RBAX in the cluster. Okay. But but there's no uh, concept of groups and Nautilus right now. Groups for users, no namespace is uh, kind of like a group. It's not really a group. Yes. So the way it works is uh, I can give some user admin status, um, and admin status means that user can start creating namespaces in the cluster. Mm -hmm. And from this point, uh, I don't. I stop managing uh, those. So basically, user is creating from one to n namespaces, and then you, this user is responsible for his namespaces, and he can add additional users. I don't manage it anymore. Okay. But this admin user is responsible for whatever is running in his his namespace, and then uh, he uh, like. Whoever he wants to onboard to his namespace, he's just invited to the cluster. They authenticate, uh, and once they authenticate, they get the guest role. And once user, once this admin uh, is adding somebody his, to his namespace, this user gets the user role or ed edit uh, role in RBAC. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, quickly move on to uh, James Clark. Sorry to delay your uh, your talk. Uh, please go ahead, and if needed, we'll we'll run into the break. So don't uh, don't talk too fast. <laughs> Jim, are you ready? I'm not hearing you at the moment. I'm afraid it's it's very very faint. Is your there we go? Maybe a little better now. Is that improved improved at all now? Yes, now it's better. Yeah, sorry about this. My laptop's been really uh, laggy. Um, let me uh, try and share my screen. 
Okay, thank you. Is that working okay? Yep, thank you. Okay, perfect. Fingers crossed then. Okay, sorry for the initial technical difficulties. Um, good morning still. Um, thank you for the opportunity to report on LIGO's recent Psy tokens progress. So I'm uh, James Clark, work for LIGO Lab from Caltech. I'm based at Georgia Tech. Um, <clears throat> these are basically just some slightly updated slides that uh, Ron Tapier, who was also on the call, uh, presented last week at the OSG workshop. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to mention and thank, thank uh, Greg Mandel, who was actually the person that led um, much, if not most, of uh, this work. It's going to be retiring and I'll be taking over, but this is, this is kind of my first plunge into uh, site tokens, so uh, bear with me. And hopefully that, yeah, looks like it transitioned okay. So I have a couple of boilerplate slides, just to give some context. People are probably reasonably familiar with the LIGO experiment, but it, um, and it might be nice to show some uh, other physics pictures. So as a reminder, uh, gravitational waves are a key prediction of general relativity, uh, perturbations in the space-time metric produced by accelerations of mass quadrupole moments. Uh, the detection and analysis of these signals carries a you know, huge amount of information about the coherent motion of the, the bodies uh, emitting uh, the signals, so namely things like their, their masses, their spins, the distribution throughout the universe, um, basically important astrophysics that uh, we wouldn't otherwise uh, have a good observational channel on. Um, but importantly, due to their weak interaction with matter, uh, the universe is kind of transparent to gravitational wave passage. Um, so, you know, a sufficiently sensitive detector would allow us to observe, you know, the most extreme astrophysical phenomena without absorption. So the universe is pretty transparent to gravitational waves. The effect is to induce a tidal strain, kind of alternately stretching and squeezing objects through which they pass. Um, but Things get difficult, of course, because their effect is incredibly weak. Um, what we would consider a strong gravitational wave induces uh, length displacements in kilometer scale detectors about the same as a, a the thousandth of the width of a proton. So it's a, it's a hard measurement. Um, and that, of course, has led to the construction and now uh, very successful. Um, operation of a global network of laser interferometer detectors and a, a whole ecosystem of data analysis strategies um, targeting different sources, which I'll spare you the details of here. But what I will mention is the, the international network. Um, so this, again, is probably pretty familiar, but uh, the, the network consists of the two four kilometer long LIGO instruments in the Northwest and Southeast US, um, a three kilometer long uh, European instrument, Virgo, based near uh, Pisa, uh, the much smaller GEO 600, kind of more or less test bed facility. Um, and more recently, uh, a Japanese detector, Kagura, has come online. Um, we actually had a joint observing run in the first quarter or so of uh, 2020 uh, with GEO. Um, just thanks to its high duty cycle. Um, I'll also mention that a third LIGO detector is to be constructed in India. I think, I think for a groundbreaking ceremony has happened. Um, uh, and that's going to be partially built from uh, old LIGO parts from a previous two kilometer long instrument. Uh, but that's expected to come online around uh, the middle of this decade, around 2025 or so. Um, Together, all of this uh, is now referred to as the International Gravitational Wave Network, or IGWIN. Um, the remainder of the talk's basically going to be pretty LIGO-centric, about LIGO computing and obviously site tokens and so on. And I thought it was worth uh, refreshing and mentioning uh, people's memories about the, the IGWIN branding, because um, it's the, the more inclusive way that we try to talk uh, about our experimental colleagues. Uh, okay, so the operation of all of these instruments and particularly the things like the development and operation of the multitude of the different analyses um, really relies on a quite diverse set of mission critical services with each with their own uh, 
sometimes slightly different authentication and authorization requirements. Um, a lot of them are really focused around data access or data discovery. Um, so I'll just pick a couple of examples uh, from this slide. I won't go, go through all of them in detail. Um, but for example, GraceDB is probably one of the more well-known ones. It's the uh, public-facing gravitational wave candidate event database. Um, it basically just reports, aggregates, and retrieves information about uh, detection candidates. So the publicly accessible information in GraceDB is limited uh, to a, an agreed subset of uh, important parameters that you know, people like external uh, observing partners are primarily interested in. Um, while only members of the collaboration, uh, so people inside LIDAR and Virgo and so on, uh, have access to uh, things like reports from ongoing and unvetted analyses, things that are not yet publicly released. And then on top of that, there's only a subset of uh, LIGO members actually authorized to upload or edit information in the database. Um, so to take another example, uh, which people, at least some people here are very familiar with, LIGO uses the uh, CERN VM uh, file system, CVRFS, to distribute a lot of proprietary instrumental data um, around the world to high throughput computing centers. Um, so only collaboration members are allowed to access uh, that data prior to its public release. Um, so that's another you know, really important uh, piece of authentication infrastructure. Uh, all of these services, um, as well as those that I didn't explicitly mention, uh, currently use X509 authentication. Um, to date, LIGO and Virgo users have been uh, blessed with access to a really convenient command line utility, which we call LIGO proxy init, uh, just retrieves a short lived X509 proxy from uh, directly from CI logon. Um, while automated services and payments use uh, proxy certificates generated from uh, you know, actual longer lived robot user certificates. And authorization for uh, different users and services is uh, basically identified just through group membership of uh, those users or robots identities in, in a central LDAP service. Uh, yeah, so I'll skip that detailed breakdown um, and just recap some of the, the details of this. Um, so obviously this has a the use of X509 has a number of implications, which uh, again, people are gonna be pretty familiar with here. Um, so user identity is of course intrinsically linked with uh, certificate possession. So as far as any of the services are concerned, if I have another user's certificate, for example, I am that user. It also means of course that um, just possessing that certificate, I'm authorized to do whatever that user can do. Uh, probably isn't going to be limited to administration for just a single service. Um, so those, those are the kind of usual uh, caveats and uh, things that we think about with certificates, but out of curiosity, um, and just to try and get some sense of scale uh, of, the, of our X509 usage, um, at least recently, uh, wrote down here a handful of statistics just from the last 15 days, uh, just because the logs were really easily accessible. Um, <clears throat> so in the last uh, two weeks or so, we've had about 300 users, uh, unique users, each using their proxy about 200 times a day, and about an order of magnitude fewer um, robot uh, certificates. Uh, but that's, you know, that's just a kind of side note really, but it's also worth noting that we're, we're busy between observing ones, and those are probably not particularly representative of uh, peak usage. So going on to more motivation. Um, so X509 is, uh, at least from my naive point of view, it's served us pretty well over the years, um, particularly thanks to the uh, LIGO proxy in it tool. <clears throat> we haven't, at least LIGO users haven't had to deal with, you know, the, the long lived user certificates for quite a long time now. I think it was around 2013 or so that came in. Um, but there are, of course, a number of, uh, like I said, familiar motivations for modernizing, which uh, you know can run through. So the retirement of the grid community toolkit has a bunch of major implications for 
pretty much all of our data distribution services from CVMFS to, you know, actual application of uh, bulk instrumental data to, from uh, observatories to central archives and uh, local replicas and so on. Um, and we're obviously interested in the improved security model offered by uh, SI tokens. But on top of that, we have a pretty natural uh, transition deadline uh, coming up in the form of the uh, next observing one, which is currently scheduled for around about June next year. So ideally, we, we're going to need to <clears throat> transition as much as we can stably uh, before June 2022. So our goals, you know, it's fa fairly obvious. It's basically to replace X509 authentication with site tokens and finally retire um, the venerable uh, LIGO proxy in it. Uh, so currently we're using grid map files to associate X509 distinguished names with local users. We'd like to replace that with more fine-grained capabilities-based authorization. And finally, basically migrate to a more federated uh, identity and remove the absolute reliance that we have on the uh, LIGO or Kerberos credentials. So in the next slide, um, I was just enumerating uh, some more specific use cases in a little bit more detail. So <clears throat> another major effort uh, that's underway in LIGO right now, and um, which I spend a certain amount of time thinking about, is the transition of uh, some of our most expensive analysis pipelines to more distributed HTC resources, mostly through the open science grid. So as I mentioned, CVMFS and its you know, associated technologies are pretty key to that model. Um, you know, there, there are other solutions for data movement, but CVMFS for authentic authentic. Oops, it looks like we've lost James for a second. Let's see if we can. Reconnect. James, are you there? Uh, you're on mute. Okay. Oops. Uh, you're on very quietly again. I think you might have to readjust your audio. Any change there? Yeah, yeah a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah, better now. Uh, but your slides dropped off. Uh, okay, bear with me. Uh, I think I was on. That should be. Yep, we're back now. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about this. Uh, so I'll just pick up from from where I was. I, I was just mentioning that some of our we do have Condor. <clears throat> Condor jobs typically near the end of workflows that need to, or at the start, that need to communicate with GraceDB. Um, so they need to authenticate with that uh, with that system, uh, like to date, as I mentioned, using X509, but um, basically with some specific and well-defined uh, roles, essentially. Um, another requirement or use case that we have, uh, you know, convenient command line tools on the cluster submit and development nodes um, and support for robot authentication. So things like cron jobs interacting with the data segment database, uh, continuous integration based tooling, um, those sorts of automated workflows. But we're also committed to supporting the researcher um, and in quotes laptop use case uh, to a limited extent in terms of operating systems. So the main point here is that we want users to be able to conveniently authenticate um, against those various services on their own, you know, self-managed machines. Um, so those were just some, some requirements. Hopefully, uh, slides stay with you. Um, so to get started, uh, we've uh, formed an internal team formed from uh, basically administrators and programmers, um, most of whom do not really have a background in any kind of identity and access management. Uh, it's really more just the, the 
rather loose collection of people who are individually responsible for developing and maintaining the affected services. Um, wouldn't want to try and put a, a timestamp on when, when that was formed, but it was in the last six months or so. Um, so the, the next step and something that's been absolutely critical uh, to this process is uh, engagement and the uh, honestly tremendous support that we get from the broader community. So we have bi-weekly working group meetings between uh, the LIGO team, <clears throat> the personnel listed there, as well as other experts and stakeholders uh, within LIGO and the broader gravitational wave community. Uh, and importantly, we, we do have this direct line uh, between calls and during calls uh, uh, to developers and experts through the OSG Slack channel. So I just wanted to stress that that's, that's been uh, really key to, to getting things moving smoothly. So I'll just say a little bit about where we, where we started in slightly more technical terms and where we're going. Um, so initial starting point for Psy tokens uh, was to explore the HT Condor local issuer. So uh, Psy tokens are basically generated by the Condor Predmon daemon itself, um, basically with the configuration listed on the slide. Um, that's given us some, some valuable lessons immediately to uh, take away from there. Um, at least to begin with, there was some, uh, I think, at least within the LIGO team, some widespread confusion about this term issuer, which may refer to either the value of S in the payload or to the actual generator of the token. Um, I think we, we generally have a better handle on that now and can understand things from context, but it, it can be confusing at times. Um, however, while the, the Condor local issuer uh, solution was pretty straightforward for the Condor use case, found it was not uh, really adaptable to uh, the variety of other use cases that I ran through. Um, so it wasn't, wasn't really up to our command line interface requirements or the robot use cases. So instead, uh, we jumped on the Vault and CI logon bandwagon, which uh, seems to be uh, serving us extremely well. Um, so here we're just using side tokens that are generated by an instance of a vault server and the command line client ht get token. Um, so I think we've, we've heard about vault already today. It's a popular open source secrets management system, uh, which can be configured to talk to UCI logon. Um, we have a test instance uh, set up and configured um, as described on the slide, which is uh, now providing us with a really excellent test bed for, for getting a handle on basically how to use tokens. So the next slide just highlights some of the, the features that we found satisfactory. Um, so they kind of directly map to our uh, various use cases that are really clearly enumerated in uh, uh, Dave Dykstra's paper, which is you can find from that link on the slide. Um, so namely, things that we, we like are that it's uh, well integrated with HT Condor, supports Kerberos with a um, convenient command line interface. Um, we expect integration and adoption within existing workflows to be very straightforward. You know, the, the user experience is, is very familiar to anyone that's been using, uh, you know, our like a proxy init tool. Um, and again, just to, to stress that, that point that, uh, you know, last but not least, we, have, we do have a direct line to and support from the developers, um, which has been invaluable. Uh, so going on. Um, so the other, another thing that uh, I think has been beneficial is that the setup and integration with Condo is pretty straightforward. It's well documented. Um, we're using Vault as the OAuth client as described uh, basically directly in the Condo manual um, with the Condo Credmon Vault uh, package installed directly from the uh, relevant YUM repository. Um, configuration has been taken from the example uh, given on the, the GitHub documentation pages. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're using the HT get token uh, command line utility to actually fetch the tokens. Uh, so the, the current LIGO instance of Vault, vault.ligo.org is deployed on a, uh, it's a pretty lightweight VM. Um, I'm pretty sure it's at Caltech, which is, like I said, it's serving us extremely well as we gain experience and familiarity with and integration with our existing tools. 
Um, and I guess looking ahead to production, I think it's likely we'll stick with Vault and probably look to exploit the uh, native high availability um, support uh, that's again as outlined in the uh, in the paper and the documentation. Um, so the current state of things, just to expand on that a little bit, Vault definitely seems to support our required use cases. Um, one thing that's maybe worth noting, and maybe Ron can say a bit more about if uh, if I miss anything pertinent, but um, our Kagra collaboration colleagues uh, do not currently have access to LIGO credentials. So that complicates access for them a little bit. But <clears throat> my understanding, uh, I think, from the basis of discussions at the workshop last week, is that uh, support for SSH keys is a, a viable path forward here. Um, so the, the Vault and HD GET token uh, system, uh, I think it sounds like we'll support SSH keys in the near future. We have a, a pretty straightforward way of moving forward that will accommodate um, the, the wider uh, collaborations as well. So in terms of actual concrete next steps, um, we're, like I said, we're at a point now where we have a functioning system in that we can generate and refresh tokens. Um, so the logical next steps are to basically finalize our namespace configurations, um, particularly the choices of things like the audience values and scopes uh, to reflect uh, collaboration data access policies um, it's going to take a certain amount of coordination and careful discussion with uh, various stakeholders to make sensible decisions, um, you know, affecting things like the CI logon configuration, the LIGO LDAP groups, and all the expected and desired um, behaviors that uh, those will influence. And there are a, a couple of outstanding issues that we uh, need to debug and resolve. Um, so. Much of our current testing, um, and I think kind of prototype use case um, is focused on the proprietary access to proprietary data in CVMFS. Um, so to date, the, the current setup has been demonstrated to uh, you know, appropriately restrict access um, if you do not have a token. And if you do have a token, uh, we can access uh, file metadata through Condor jobs. So we can list files, we can see that there, but there are there is a known issue uh, that's um, being worked on um, in actually accessing the data through CVMFS with site tokens. Um, the other kind of big, uh, more, I suppose, policy item uh, being beginning to be discussed now is basically that of tracing and auditability. So services really need to be able to associate um, access with response with a responsible party so you know particularly in cases where there may be problematic or um, potentially abusive usage um, so we need to be careful here in that you know we, we could can, can uh, encode user identities into the subclaims of tokens um, using uh, the LIGO identity that we already have so albert.einstein is the uh, uh, canonical um, username, um, but we, we do need to take care to avoid using that subclaim itself uh, for authorization, um, which you know would obviously defy the spirit of the, the capa capability-based authorization system entirely. And then on top of that, with, you know, I, and I guess also as part of a wider discussion that affects a lot of other things, we need to be uh, careful about regarding careful about uh, GDPR implications for our European colleagues and recording. Mm -hmm. Things like people's usernames um, and identifiable information on non-European servers and so on. It's very much an open question. Uh, so finally, I think in terms of timelines, um, we're most likely looking at a rolling transition of services from X509 to SI tokens, um, likely with some crossover uh, to begin with, um, you know, with some services still using X509, others uh, being some earlier adopters. Um, but I would say we're probably looking at finalizing uh, the configurations I mentioned and standing up a production level vault by the end of the year, um, hopefully with full support for authenticated CVMFS, um, since it's, our, like I said, our main test case. 
Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the, the start of the next observing run in, in June next year gives us a pretty strict deadline for major potentially breaking changes, uh, which will all need to be implemented and resolved well before uh, that observing run 04. Um, so with that, I think I'll just leave up the acknowledgement slide and attempt to stop sharing. And hopefully I haven't dropped off again. Uh, thanks, James. That was uh, very good. Uh, appreciate it. Um, any immediate questions people have for James before we move on? We do. We are well on time. I was mistaken earlier. I was looking at the wrong time. So uh, we have a good eight minutes or so. So if there's something you'd like to ask. I put one question in the chat. I don't know if it's... Uh, very good. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, there are a number of uh, European sites based on the ArcCE, which is not going to be ready for um, tokens by the summer. So how is LIGO going to submit jobs to those type of sites? For example, NICEF. Yeah, I, th I mean, that's a great question. And frankly, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I've been curious about the, <laughs> the integration with uh, other sites that may not be using site tokens by that point. I, I, I could try an answer on that one, uh, Misha, which I, my, my understanding, although I can't uh, attest to have actually tested things out, is that the existing um, ArcCE support or, or token support is, is good enough for what LIGO needs. Um, I haven't seen the Condor team yet uh, work through that uh, the, the existing support to, to see if there's missing gaps, but uh, I, I suspect it's enough. Uh, the thing that ArcCE is, um, I, I think, going to be quite complex to do, uh, which is when it reaches into the system and pulls out the payload jobs instead of the pilot jobs. Uh, isn't used by, by LIGO. So, so I, I, th I think in the end, it, it's quite possible that for what peop what LIGO needs from the ArcCE is either already implemented or kind of at the 90% level. Okay. I, I had the feeling it wasn't there yet, but we, we have to have a look at that. How, how I, I think that's yeah. I think that's a good feeling. <laughs> but there's, 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 there's different levels of not quite there yet, right? There, yeah. There, there, there are some pieces where it's not even on paper yet, and there's some pieces that are you know uh, kind of prototype exists, part of released code, but no one's kicked the tires, so it probably doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, we did some some preliminary testing and it, it wasn't even possible really to test, but it, yeah, anyway. How, how, how strict is the timeline of June, 2020? 20, uh, 22, sorry. I, I think this this one's probably not so bad. Uh, in fact, I was looking at the Condor pages. They, they technically said September, but June, September, it's the same. Um, particularly because I think the submission to ArcCE is also done in straight OpenSSL these days. And, and, and really okay. the, the, the push, the, the thing pushing the deadlines is the, re, uh, the retirement of the grid community toolkit. So I think these things are actually somewhat decoupled and quite possibly fun. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a really interesting discussion on the LCG authorization discussion list, where Oxana, who's actually uh, coordinating most of the RCE development, actually uh, posed a set of really interesting questions. Because uh, at the moment, there's no SSH submission to ArcSees. ArcSees at the moment do X509 using forms proxies. And although I think they've participated in several hackathons to actually see whether 
basic submission would work. I think the, the primary focus there would be WLCG tokens. And as far as I know it, but maybe Andrea can comment on that, that uh, still requires now both a proxy and the token, if only to access the uh, data and do the data transfer between the CE and the worker nodes. But at the moment, there's no SSH submission to ArcSees, just none. Do you mean SSH or say tokens? Uh, there's no SSH involved anywhere. Y yes, but, but I think what, what James was talking about was uh, token-based submission. Uh, as far as I have understood the thread, at the moment, you can submit using WLCG tokens to an ARC CE, but you have to also provide a proxy to make it work. So now you need both. Yeah, that is at least the case with ARC sub. So basically with that, you can't test even whether it works because you <laughs> you will basically still use a proxy. But yeah, there, there, there is lots of discussion going on and it, it it's there is sort of a rudimentary implementation of some token support in the ARC CE but it doesn't feel like this would be ready in, in half a year to be actually production grade um, site token support. I, I don't see that happening, but it's, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit of a worry from us, I think. Is the, is the concern with uh, reaching that uh, matter of simply resources or uh, what are the other things um, you think yeah. that are in the way well, of that? The, the, Go ahead. If I can comment, if there's uh, no support left to submit using uh, X509 certificates to ArcSees, then uh, as soon as uh, X509 support is decommissioned from LIGO, all the European resources will drop out. Until, of course, the support is commissioned into the ARC-C, but all the ARC-C resources will just disappear. But, but like I, I said, I, I, I'm not overly worried about this because I, I don't think that this capability is actually going away in, in June. Uh, again, I, I, I can check, but I believe this is implemented with OpenSSL directly. And also, I, I think the, the rudimentary support is pretty pretty close to, to what's needed anyway. Right? We, we have, again, it turns out it's September. We, we have 11 months to shore up the rudimentary support. So I, I think it's doable, even if we had to. OK. Um... Let's move on. Uh, our next speaker is, let's see, oh, it's Brian. So um, if you have your slides, uh, this is the HD Condor and OSG token transition review, everything we learned from Thursday, Friday and before, I'm sure. So um, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, one second, I'm just setting up the screen share here. No worries. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I stick somewhat to my mandate and somewhat go go broader. So, um, here we go. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, where Condor and OSG are in terms of the, the token transition. Uh, so, so I think I have 30 minutes here. Uh, I, I probably have two hours worth of material prepared, so uh, don't be afraid to uh, butt in and, and ask questions. It's meant to inspire discussion more uh, than, than actually try to get through all of this. Uh, so looking through the participant list, I, I figured a, a good number of folks are quite familiar with OSG and what we're trying to accomplish. And, and actually I was happy to see uh, a good number of faces I, and names I didn't recognize. So uh, I did ha have a little bit of the beginning here. So uh, what we're trying to do is enable uh, high throughput computing and, and particularly in OSG, we like to call about, uh, talk about distributed high throughput computing. So um, 
we've actually been doing some internal exercises to come up with a definition of high throughput computing. Uh, but the one I, I use here is, is trying to maximize the throughput uh, of a computing resource toward a, a common problem. And within the OSG, we, we really talk a lot about distributed high throughput computing. So really trying to, to utilize uh, computing resources across many independent collaborating uh, administrative domains. Uh, so here on, on the right side, uh, I produce a, a little map of both uh, the storage and computing resources within the US. Uh, I'll note that our, our funding is, is from the U, uh, US funding agencies uh, to participate in the OSG, although there's quite a few resources that we connect to outside. And when you get these, this number of folks in the picture and these number uh, of sites that have many sometimes conflicting administrative uh, and security concerns, uh, that means that one thing that's really important is uh, trust and figuring out uh, authorization models. Uh, so historically, there's been within the community quite a bit of effort uh, thinking about authorization and hopefully this carries forward and remains active for many years. Um, so the OSG itself is a consortium. Uh, interestingly enough, it's not, not even a legal entity. It's a group of people that work together for the cause. Um, and we like to think of it as a consortium that provides a fabric of services, uh, including uh, a software stack that organizations can take and use to build uh, distributed high throughput computing environments. Important to note that OSG actually owns no resources. So there is no OSG cluster. Uh, and again, not a legal organization, so it pays no staff. Uh, and instead, what it does is it coordinates the efforts contributed by projects. Uh, some of the big ones right now are IRSTEP and uh, PATH. And uh, the, you know, the sorts of services it provides besides just the software itself, uh, are, are say the, the open science pool, uh, a DHTC environment for any science uh, group or their collaborators doing open science within the US. Uh, so kind of quick stats in terms of size and shape. Uh, again, within the US, think about you know, 100 or so different endpoints. Endpoints we connect to outside the US, maybe uh, about order of 300 total. And in terms of resources that report uh, accounting hours, uh, basically how, how resources were utilized through the OSG, it's about 2 billion over uh, 12 months. Um, so OSG uh, has grown up and evolved over about a 20, slightly less than 20 year history. And uh, where we grew up and where we really started as what I'd call a, an identity-centric world. Uh, a lot of our uh, blood, sweat, and tears went into things uh, that were really identity-related. You know, how, how are identities established between a, a client and a server? Uh, once you give an identity to an entity, how, how are these revoked so they're no longer trusted for whatever reason? Uh, how can they be delegated and, and impersonated? And what are the different models that identities can be used for, for authorization? And toward these different questions, uh, the, the infrastructure that was built and engaged with and participated with uh, across the world uh, really revolved around the, the idea of users establishing uh, a global identity uh, having uh, trust across the globe for that particular identity, and then uh, using that to access the services needed. So uh, at the time, the, the way that these services were envisioned to be used uh, was really that the users would go all around the world and, and get, get at these directly. So, so maybe uh, if I'm a user that has a million jobs, uh, I, I would take a thousand of these jobs and split them up across over a hundred different sites worldwide. So that's kind of where we started. And um, strangely enough, where we've ended up, you know, the, the trend line has been 
that users utilize uh, fewer and fewer grid services, which is a very confusing statement. So I'll unpack that thing uh, a, a bit. Uh, uh, in particular, for example, I, I think zero users submit uh, science payload jobs directly to sites on the OSG. So instead of the model where users talk to individual resources, what's happened are users uh, are interested in the OSG as part of some organization that they're doing, whether that organization might be the open science pool I mentioned, whether it's CMS, Atlas, LIGO, uh, Fermi Lab experiments, uh, Dune, you, you name the organization. And it turns out those users have that relationship with the organization, whether you know, maybe an experiment. And the experiment in turn establishes relationships with the different resources. So certainly users utilize resources distributed throughout the world, but the services that they interact with uh, are not the ones that the, the individual sites provide. Uh, again, for those of us that have been doing this for 20 years, uh, this, this is a strange way of view of the world, uh, but I'd claim it, it, it makes sense to the large part. Uh, uh, if you take the example uh, of Amazon, uh, whether it's for LIGO or uh, for example, the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory is uh, heavily utilizing many cloud services. You, you want to take your thousand scientists and create a thousand hundred dollar gift cards, give them the gift cards to tell them to go have fun. Instead, the, the collaboration would build some sort of services. The collaboration would interact with Amazon and handle billing. And then the users would interact with the collaboration services. So, and, and uh, I guess you'd call it the cloud world. This model makes a lot of sense. And indeed, we even see this in other places. Uh, a great example here is exceed community accounts where the resource provider interacts with the community, community interacts with the user. So uh, how the users interact with services and how they utilize resources has evolved quite a bit. So we are looking to evolve our authorization model to, to match the, the usage point. Uh, so it's it's fair to say, you know, Brian, you know, what is it that you have against the identity? Why, why, why push this? Um, and my my basic argument here is identity is important uh, where it's needed, uh, but places where identity isn't utilized as part of the the an authorization model, it's it's expensive to establish and, and bring forward. Uh, so again, with the example of the open science pool. Uh, as a site, I might provide my resources to the open science pool, and I don't need to make authorization decisions based on the, the individual users there. Now, there are important things that we need to do. Uh, so we, we may need to take two requests and determine if they came from two individuals, uh, distinct individuals or the same person. Uh, traceability remains important. Um, and, but these are often independent of the authorization decision itself. Uh, that side, that said, looking at the other side of the coin, there are places where this is really important. Uh, and, and this is where users have a direct relationship with the resource or the service. Great examples include uh, requiring uh, identity for SSH, login access to a host. That's really difficult to do purely based on say capabilities. Or giving out home directory space. You know, your your home is an important concept, and for sites, you often want a very strong identity there. So on the Condor side of the house, uh, has Condor has a long uh, has for for a long time has not needed the concept of a global identity within its ecosystem. Uh, users establish identity with the, the access point or the submit host or the submit node or SCED, whatever you would like to call it. Um, and, and this is true e even within the OS pool where, for example, uh, before anybody can get access to the access point, uh, they have to do a, a video call with OSG staff to, to verify identity. 
But then daemons within the Condor pool uh, authenticate with the uh, central manager uh, and establish identity to advertise their existence location. But these don't have to be a global identity. The uh, execution point, which runs jobs, and the access point don't actually have to have mutual authentication with each other. They can do it transitively through the central manager. And uh, of course, the execution point, uh, except in very specific cases, say when you want to have NFS access, um, doesn't need to know or understand the identity of the user on the access point. Uh, so particularly if you think of cases where we're launching jobs inside containers, uh, the end identity of the user doesn't, isn't needed for authorization decisions. Again, important other things like, uh, um, like uh, traceability or septic discussion. So uh, an OSG, which grew up based on identity, uh, authorization was done through identity mapping. Requests were authenticated to a global identity. The global identity was mapped to a local one. And then the request was authorized based on what that local identity was allowed to do. And we're trying to move toward uh, where we can uh, capabilities. Uh, so any particular request can say carry a bear token issued by an organization. The token be, can be verified to have come from that organization. So that's an important step. Uh, the token indicates whether the request is authorized by that organization. And then the service can look at the, the union of those two things. Does the organization have the ability to do this in the first place? And was this request authorized by the organization itself? So here, the service and the organization each understand each other's identities, but the requester doesn't and the authorization decision. So these tokens end up describing uh, what the requester can do, not necessarily who they are. So a good question is, you know, if these if Condor's done this for a while and OSG is a heavy user of Condor, uh, why why are we suddenly talking about this uh, quite quickly? And um, we're not only trying to to implement the the model that we thought has been important for a while, but we actually have an externally driven uh, transitions in software and changes in credential technology. Uh, another thing that's really been uh, helping. Uh, accelerate the shift is in 2020, NSF funded the partnership to advance throughput computing, which is a partnership between OSG and CHTC, which produces the Condor software suite. Uh, and that really uh, ties the, the two approaches uh, together quite closely and has added onto the effort for other partner projects like IRIS have site tokens and SIA. So where are we in the token transition? Well, uh, again, a lot of this was kicked off by externally. So uh, May 2017, Globus announced the, the end of the support for the Globus Toolkit. Uh, also in 2017, NSF funded uh, the Site Tokens Project, which enabled a lot of the R&D necessary for our transition. Uh, later in that year, OSG helped form the Grid Community Tool Forum, which uh, forked the Globus Toolkit. And uh, later in 2019, after a couple of years of work, OSG announced the transition plan for the, the OSG software stack. So this transition away from the, uh, what was originally the Globus software, uh, we're say toward the end stage here, you know, about five years total. And I'd say maybe somewhere in the middle for, for tokens itself. So it turns out uh, there's other software providers that can uh, delegate or, or use tokens and, and Globus isn't the only software technology. So even though we're nearing the end for the grid community toolkit support on the OSG, uh, as you can tell from the different presentations today, uh, we're maybe in the middle, or at least if you're like me, the internal optimist somewhere in the middle for tokens. So uh, we're about five months away from the end of life uh, for the OSG support. Uh, and you know, there's an obvious question of, are we ready? You know, five months is enough time to, to write some ships and make some changes, but uh, not so far away that it's uh, completely opaque. And last week we had a two day workshop. Uh, first day uh, was an overview of the status from OSG and plenary talks from communities. 
And the second day covered uh, both the data services, uh, particularly Ruscio and FTS, uh, discussion about community's concerns and some actual working sessions for, for sysadmins to, for example, uh, try to configure their sites uh, to accept tokens. Uh, so the basic message is that all, all the communities who showed up and present are making great progress across the board. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of the pieces reported. And uh, February 22 looks realistic. Uh, if anything, I, I like to say the, the error bars are, are measured in, in say months and, and certainly not years. In parallel, uh, Condor has been carefully coordinating uh, with the OSG and uh, this year announced their own schedule, uh, which we're about may, maybe halfway through. So we start dropping support for older deprecated components such as Graham and Cream, adding support, improved and existing or initial support uh, for ArcCE's REST interface. Uh, where we're needing to carry on proxies for, for a while longer, uh, we are re-implementing some things uh, purely within uh, OpenSSL and not relying on the grid community toolkit. And looking forward, we have kind of exciting, uh, about a year or so ahead of us. Uh, so the, the, the rest of the plan uh, includes this month, a release of Condor 9.3, where GSI is no longer uh, enabled uh, in the compilation by default. Uh, next year, we're projecting around March uh, as a new long-term stable release of Condor, which we'll probably call 10.0, uh, which won't have GSI. And then six months after the new LTS version, the, the support for the old LTS version, which would be the 9X, 9.0 series will end. So uh, according to this timeline, and depending on exactly when 10.0 comes out, we're looking at about a September 22 end of support for GSI authentication. So there's three places uh, in Condor where there's uh, use of tokens right now. So site tokens are authorization. Uh, so that is to establish a client server relationship with uh, a site token or WLC, WLCG token. Uh, so this is done over a TLS connection, meaning the host still needs a host certificate. Uh, and we use public key discoveries and OAuth to metadata discovery. There's what we call ID tokens, which is establishing an identity inside Condor. Uh, this is a bit simpler mechanism, uh, but also not quite not flexible. It uses uh, symmet symmetric encryption, so it uses HMAC signatures on the tokens. Uh, server needs to have a, a signing key, but there's there's no certificate, so that's a bit easier to bootstrap, but of course only is realistically used inside a single administrative domain. And then finally within Condor, we have a uh, job and credential management where a job can describe credentials or tokens that they need. And the, the Condor demons can ensure that these are acquired, managed and renewed as, as needed. Uh, so a great example of these, of course, is the vault plugin that uh, Dave gave a the uh, lightning talk earlier today. Uh, so for example, on the open science pool, uh, we generate a site token for CE. Uh, this goes from front end to factory and eventually to site and allows the factory to authenticate to the site and uh, uh, submit pilots. Uh, also on the open science pool, uh, we use uh, token, the ID tokens. Again, since these are generated by the OS pool to talk to the OS pool, uh, and these can be done to connect the execution point central manager. Uh, so this is done uh, through the classical grid request mechanism, again, front end factory CE uh, to get pilots started. Uh, but we've had a couple of folks come up and utilize ID tokens uh, that they can request through all off two in order to uh, uh, start up uh, Kubernetes pods. So we have maybe at any given time, uh, somewhere around 5,000 cores uh, authenticated via uh, ID tokens. And then finally for job access to storage, 
this predated the work that Dave uh, did and, and actually is what uh, James referenced uh, as the simple mechanism that wasn't sufficient for the LIGO case where anybody who has access to the access point uh, run by OSG uh, can uh, get token storage tokens with, for their jobs. The tokens are carried around with uh, the jobs to the execution point and they could be used to access uh, over the HTTP protocol, what we call the origin, which might carry the data. Uh, so status, uh, right now, uh, 52 CEs uh, for the OS pool case, except site tokens for job submission. 95% uh, of the ones operated by OSG. Uh, so basically we have one broken CE uh, support uh, site token based submission. Uh, ID tokens, about 95% of them uh, of our execution points come through the ID tokens. So the, the remaining 5% that are still using GSI, we think of those misconfigurations that need to be stomped out. And storage access, uh, again, that, that James had mentioned earlier, uh, has been enabled for all users for OSG Connect for over three years. So CHTC itself uh, shares a lot of technologies as the OS pool, but maybe at a slightly smaller scale. And they have already taken another important step, which is upgrading to the Condor 930 release candidate. Uh, so now we know that none of the demons in that particular pool utilize GSI. And it kind of has been the bleeding edge to catch configurations, problems, anything where there were hidden dependencies on GSI before, um, before we step up to the open science pool. Uh, so other presenters within uh, the, the workshop last week include Atlas. Uh, Atlas has been able to successfully submit uh, to their, use their pilot factory harvester to BNL in Chicago. Uh, they believe they're on schedule uh, uh, to move by February 22. Uh, their ArcCE sites, like we just mentioned with LIGO, are one point of concern that we're keeping a watch on that will need to switch to the REST interface by June 22. And they're predicting that user jobs, particularly for storage access, as the LHC run three is just starting, will probably use X509 for, for plug syncing. Uh, CMS presented uh, and talked about how they've been able to successfully test tokens at OSG sites, but uh, just in their testing instance, not yet in production. Uh, they noticed a couple places where internally, not even with grid resources, where they use, say, uh, services like Argus to, to map user proxies to Unix accounts and still need to figure out how to replace this internally. This is an example of something that's going to be decoupled from and uh, take much longer than the, the OSG retirement of the token use. And they actually talked quite a bit about uh, how they're working on switching to HTTP TPC, uh, which is definitely part of the retirement of Globus Grid FTP uh, and uh, seen as a prerequisite to moving data transfers uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, token-based authorization. So the HTTP TPC transition is in the tail end right now, uh, but there's still quite a bit left to do on database or, or token based uh, data movement. Uh, Fermilab and Brookhaven uh, had their site reports. Uh, I actually missed that. Minet had a lightning talk here, so I won't rehash that. Uh, but the Brookhaven aspect I, I thought was really interesting that they, they noted that they had six different experiments with very different needs. Uh, some they're the host lab for, some they're not. Uh, example, KEK for Bell 2, uh, you know, there a lot of their work and activities are going to be driven by that particular host lab. Uh, so that's, you know, it is, a, it is a great reminder that of how interconnected all these different pieces are. And I'll also point out that both Fermilab and Brookhaven really highlight the need uh, locally to coordinate closely with DOE cybersecurity, uh, since a lot of the original agreements were set up, you know, again, many, many years ago, and the security landscape has been very evolving ever since. So a couple closing thoughts. Uh, we've been talking about the importance of capabilities and making sure our authorization model matched 
how users actually utilize the resources for many years. It's accelerated quite a bit uh, in the last four. And somehow, even though we've been working really hard on this for four years, it feels like just here I say the last year, but the last weeks and months, uh, like we were taking those first uh, production steps. So it's a really exciting time for, for the OSG. Um, the, the plan end of support uh, is February 22. We set that date in November, 2019. Uh, it looks like we'll, we'll make it. Uh, again, my, uh, my thinking is the error bars are gonna be measured in months and not years, certainly. Uh, but this isn't the end goal for, for transitioning to, to tokens and, and building a token-based infrastructure. Uh, as we've seen today, many workflows will still rely on GSI for user identities. Uh, WLCG has a plan of milestones that last right now through 2025, which means kind of the, the really deliberate pace uh, of the transition, uh, if we complete it by then, will we'll be about eight years. And I think that's important to, to highlight to folks that this is not, uh, you know, these, these sorts of infrastructure move on the scale of a decade and not the scale of, say, individual uh, research projects funded by funding agencies. And, you know, just finally, I, I like to point out that we are looking at the entire approach to authorization and not just translating the existing systems to new technologies, which we think uh, make efforts like the, the SIOF project Jim mentioned so important. And so um, as a provocative ending slide to make sure I get your questions, uh, you know, there's this old saying that you can write Fortran in any, any language. And I'd say that you can also uh, implement X509 or uh, GSI in any, using any technology you'd like to. And our goal is to not do that and really rethink about what's the appropriate way to do authorization in our infrastructure. So that I'll stop and uh, give you guys a couple of minutes to throw tomatoes at me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, you got a minute and a half to throw tomatoes and 10 minutes to do so during the break if you want to. Um, go ahead, we have uh, one in the chat here. Let's see. Oh, see a comment. <laughs> comment that OIDC is SAML only, someone didn't like XML and redid it in JSON. Um, that's probably true. You no, know, Matthew, I, I'm looking forward to the next person who redoes it all on YAML. So, <laughs> right. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to get a working group together because <laughs> let's let's take this to the next next level. Let's do it in like CSV. Oh no! I and I files, S expressions. <laughs> Where are the, all the lispers? Yeah, I was about to say, where's my, where's my list? Uh, I'm uh, telling you, we need to yeah. get a working group together. It'd be great. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. This has been fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I really I appreciate out, all of your time. There's a lot of links in this and links back to the, the talks from last week. Uh, so if you want to dig in, uh, there, there's a good number of slide decks. And I'm hoping we'll, we'll get some videos up soon as well. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll definitely, um, I don't know if we have everyone's uh, slide decks linked to the uh, SciAuth workshop uh, uh, page yet, uh, but if it's not there now, uh, we will make sure to get them up there shortly. And we will, uh, it is our intent to take the recording here and uh, chop it up and make it available for um, review if people want to uh, look at it offline if you weren't able to uh, see the earlier uh, sessions. So it's uh, one o'clock Eastern. I'd like to take a 10 minute break. Um, and then uh, after the break, uh, we'll just get started on a discussion. And it's uh, basically open season, but um, let's take 10 minutes, uh, grab your lunch, do what you got to do. And uh, we'll be back at 110 Eastern, which is approximately nine minutes from now. Thank you.
Okay, Doc. So we've uh, we've had several information rich presentations and uh, and uh, short talks uh, all this morning. Certainly, plenty to to chew on. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, uh, contributions and um, everybody who's here attending. I think I saw a high water market of 60, 63 attendees. So thank you very much. Um, about to open an open discussion on the kinds of things that we think uh, the community needs to coordinate, work on, prioritize. Um, um, you know, speaking from my hat as, as chair of TAG PMA, one of the three IGTF uh, policy management authorities that uh, accredit uh, certificates for IGTF and um, authentication providers in general, although in, historically they've been CAs to date. Um, you know, my only my own particular interest is in what you know IGTF and TAG PMA can do to to um, um, help the community standardize and establish trust that is uh, interoperable um, in the uh, token issuers and, and so forth. And I welcome discussion on that. But let me bring up a, a, a different list of questions that I've kind of slammed together based on um, what I've seen uh, from the prior uh, workshop and this one uh, if I've got this correct and let's see so here we are um yeah I don't know if this will work I'll move it did it did it did I lose it sorry that's what I get for moving it across screens um, so that, I mean, there's various questions, I think, in just trust management in general. Um, and we've had some questions about what does it mean for, you know, users and consents management, whether there need to be better interfaces for that, or whether we just say, look, you know, if you want to play in this game, these are the things you're going to have to agree to. Um, so from a relying party perspective, how are they uh how are they managing the education of the user base um and what it means to move to uh token-based authentication authorization um there have been questions about what the common threat model is what do we understand the the um the security uh, concerns of this environment to be um and are they reasonable and should they be um you know how should they be addressed uh, clearly, interoperation across federations, so federations of identity providers. Um, um, I don't know that we have federations of token issuers yet, but you know. Um, and then uh, also interoperation internationally, locally, uh, interproject between the uh, workflows that uh, they've implemented. Um, We've heard a lot of people using specific technologies. Um, the HashiCorp uh, vault comes to mind and, and other things. And uh, um, are, you know, what other mechanisms for dealing with uh, token storing, renewal, the whole life cycle, um, do we need to pay attention to? Um, we still, you know, people are trying to establish standards for the contents of tokens. Um, people are wondering what does it mean in terms of levels of assurance? Uh, you know, uh, can a token be more assuring than others based on, you know, something about the token that, that we can establish higher uh, faith in? Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, what, what should the IGTF PMAs and IGTF in general do to sustain and take advantage of the enormous investment over decades now in a trust relationships between um, authentication providers, relying parties, uh, international communities of interest. Um, and I, look to something I think Hannah brought up, which was the attribute authority uh, document that was brought up 
uh, and worked on um, in Jiant and and uh, elsewhere uh, to try and establish some expectations for how these things ought to be operated. Um, and with that, I, I, I will just open it to the floor and say, uh, what do you guys think? Are there other burning questions we should be asking? Or if there's any one of these you want to dive into, um, have at it. So, so if I can, you know, plus one, two, two of these uh, topics that you put up here. One is uh, standards for, for token contents. Um, mm -hmm. And how how these uh, continue to get moved forward. I, I uh, put it in the chat uh, earlier this morning that uh, you know the, the WLCG profile uh, has served the WLCG community very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about two years old, and since then, uh, some of the things that we decided on have become standardized in, in slightly different ways. Uh, by the IETF. So I, I think trying to figure out how and uh, where these sorts of conversations can continue to evolve, I, I think would be uh, really quite useful. Um, another one I'd like to plus one is this, this very last one about uh, accrediting token issuers, right? I, I think they're if I can maybe uh, <laughs> misrepresent uh, IGTF, uh, but the one of the real powers of that was, you know, the, the idea that there could be this description of, you know, you know a, a handful of descriptions of uh, uh, trust levels or, or trust assurance, uh, and then sites could decide what they needed and uh, CAs could, could assert what they had. And if the two sides kind of could understand that simple language, they can understand who they are able to trust. So kind of there's a lot of power in that uh, somewhat standardizing, simplifying the world into a couple of different assurance profiles. Um, and I, you know, uh, this came up in the OSG discussion last week, where uh, you know I think it was Steve Tim from Fermilab you know, talking about Dune, who was saying, "How do I get sites to trust my token issuer?" You know how mm -hmm. I, I you know he he was not relishing the idea of having a one by one discussion with sites about the. Uh, how the trust works for their particular token issuer. So I, I think this is, I, 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 I don't know if, if the attribute authorities operational guidelines is, is the right link, but I, I think there's a lot of policy work that could be leveraged here, pre-existing and maybe even tuned up a little to, to, to better hit this case. Right, it's certainly true um, and uh... You know, David Grepp can uh, correct me uh, when I miss say misspeak things, but I mean, we've done a lot of work uh, in IGTF uh, to describe, particularly for authentication things, um, uh, things in terms that are sort of technology agnostic. Um, uh, but I think we need to try and at least paint a picture or 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 author maybe one or more documents to explain how what we already have applies uh, or could apply to these token issuers um, and the way they are operated and what the expectations are uh, for um, reasonable, acceptable operation of such issuers, uh, including ancillary services to um, check and continue the veracity of things, maybe some automated things, who knows. Um, uh, and I think um, there's certainly an opportunity to uh, help organizations that are creating these uh, token issuing services 
to um, get themselves together uh, in in some fashion and to uh, talk to the broader trust community about um, how what 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 constitutes the perhaps the IGTF distribution for token issuers. You know, what 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 information needs to be in that? Um, what should the CPCPS look like? You know, the what we used to call the you know, certification process and for CAs and stuff. Is there a token issuer policy and uh, procedure statement that is analogous to the what is it, 3647 litany of things that we put in a policy document to say, yes, this is what you know my token issuer does. Um, this these are the pieces of the tokens that come out and these are the fields and this is what you should be able to ex expect and and uh, here's how you figure out whether a token's been revoked or has is no longer you know um, trustworthy um, David do you have uh, any sage words for us on this in this department I could share a few a few thoughts for, first of all I think we've been trying to be very rigorous in splitting off technology and trust information. So the assurance profiles, we have aligned those, for example, also with the, the re, uh, REFATS assurance framework. So you get mm -hmm. Cappuccino being equated to, say, Birch and Cedar, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. And the technology is also split off in various elements. It's quite closely aligned in that respect to the ARC policy development kit. And there's already a link to the, the ARC documents there. I think what has been in, extremely important, the kind of value of the IGTF, is to foster trust between previously unlinked parties. Mm -hmm. the, what the distribution enables is you being able to trust an issuer, be it a token issuer or an identity issuer or whatever, without having to do the review yourself because you trust the self-assessment and peer review process that actually underpins most of the RGTF distribution. This could be an important value to add in the token issuer and ARC uh, proxy sphere, where you actually, you join up, you do peer reviewed self-assessment, which is a process we know perfectly well from our academic uh, environment, and use that to inspire trust in each other's proxies, because you know they operate to the same standard, and somebody who is at least as knowledgeable as you has actually looked at that self-assessment. And that's a process we could actually encourage between some of these token issuers, between, say, LIGO and WLCG, between, uh, say, uh, Edu Teams and a generic OSG token issuer, is that that model of peer-reviewed self-assessment, which we also kind of encouraged for the wise SCI community, would be, a, I think, a true value and save a lot of work for everyone, especially on the relying party side. I, I, I like the idea, you know, of course, if I think back of like the, uh, I think I once saw the, the uh, not the criteria, the, whatever the document is for, for VO peer review for, oh gosh, what do we call it? Oh, I don't even remember what it was, but you know the, the list of questions, right? You know the, the framework or the you know the structure of, of the peer review. Um, I I think it would be really useful, and maybe we should use WLCG as a guinea pig because I don't I don't see Hannah here to object uh, to, to try to say if we wanted to peer review the WLCG issuer, what what does it even mean? You know what what is what is the framework we do that with them? I think that would be hugely uh, uh, it's instructional. I think we'd learn a lot. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think there's a there's been an eagerness, clearly, I think, in certainly I've felt it the last couple of years for us to do something in this space and um, you know, in addition to this peer-reviewed self-assessment as a model, which has worked well in, in, in IGTF, um, you know, part of me sort of also wonders whether 
again, you know, in the absence of paid for resources to do this, it's always hard to do, but um, I know that one of the qualifications in, in other uh, operational profiles is that, for example, on a, on a web base, uh, on a web server, you would go to the SSL labs and you'd need a certain grade to be sufficient, right? That you've, that you've sufficiently secured your web service. Um, and it'd be awfully nice if, if uh, and, and I believe I saw some tools, um, uh, was it jwt.io that had some uh, things you could throw a token at and, and look at and do various things. I think some, some tools to help people sort of see, you know, what is this thing and, and, and is it coming from somewhere I trust and, and what can I use to, to um, understand how the, these tokens work better and, and whether or not uh, they're coming from someplace I, I, I'd be willing to trust. Um, that to me sounds like it might help the community become more comfortable with this because we are seeing a sea change here and there's a lot of i think angst if not uh, uh gnashing of teeth about what this means and how much it's going to disrupt people's workflows to to move over um are there other um questions we're not asking uh things that you'd like to see, um, things that the community should be doing, um, services you wish you had or, or instructional information you wish you had to, to move forward um, within the community or? I think having a, um a concise listing of implementations for interpreting tokens would be helpful. Uh, the reason I say that is, is there is a there was a bug. I think it was in the Java based implementation that allowed you to bypass all authentication by setting the pre shared key to the uh, to the public key of the web server. Hmm. And yeah, I, I imagine these, these I don't want to recommend you know, using that one. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's that's you know, and, and I think like anything, you know, we we I don't know whether that's part of the threat model, but you know, we have to understand what is it that we have to secure. Um there are pieces of software that seem to have been uh commonly put into um service to to serve as um, secure um, credential stores and, and things of that nature in this environment um, but yeah I mean we we talked about this at the last workshop as well that I would like to understand the the use cases um, and to see everybody's perspective uh, those of you who may have been at the last one in, in November of last year um, recall that, people were clearly working within their own environments a lot and trying to solve the, how do I transition from what I'm using now in, in my corner of the world for my local users, and I'm gonna have to figure out how to interoperate with those other people later. And I think there are definitely attempts. Um, I know coming up, uh, Psyoth has a, um, a call, I would assume it's a meeting uh, on the 28th of October, let me stop sharing this for a second. Um, I had the do this here. It's this. So um, our friends at Psyop have a, a call to try and um, I think um, they're saying merging site tokens and WLCG profiles and and, and part of this is, you know, geared toward this interoperability between um, communities of interest that have uh, um, clearly developed things for their parts of the world and, and, and not wanting to have to fight and translate between, well, what does this mean if I, if I use this you know, profile and the associated toolkits and so forth? Um, 
So I would encourage anybody who's interested in this sort of thing to, to participate in this call. Um, and that's in what, a week and a half, so on the 28th. Um, the SciAuth.org uh, website in and of itself has, has a lot of good information in it. Um, and uh, I think that will, that will foster much of what has been talked about um, in the earlier parts of this day. Um, and, and Derek, that's exactly what I meant about uh, finding uh, a location to have these discussions, right? You know, the, the WLC2 mm -hmm. group is, is nice and, and, and active about this and, you know, kind of keeps things living and pushing things forward. And certainly for me, I, I really enjoy its mixture of both policy and you know, technical, you know, writing code, get things done. But it, it's not 100% mm -hmm. clear to me that WLCG itself should be owning its own profile. So I, you know, I, I struggle with a lot, you know, where, you know, as we said, profiles or best practices or WLCG had this, has this great little document about how to discover a token in a Unix environment, which is super necessary for all the tools we have, but uh, kind of feels strange WLCG is doing this. So uh, certainly something I'd open up to the community of where, where is the right forum for, for some of these? Well, I would say that those that feel the need to, to solve the problem first and who publicize it generally get the, get the first attention. And um, they're a very large worldwide you know, community of, of high energy physics people. So uh, it's not surprising to me that the WLCG folks are, are charging ahead with this. Um, but that said, you know, if, if what the work that they have done uh, jives with what other communities uh, who have similar workflow, authentication, interoperability requirements need, um, that's fine. Um, from an IGTF perspective, I think what we want is to glean from all the communities uh, what their particular requirements are and to try and figure out whether in terms of creating a, a layer, a, a, a trust uh, basis, whether or not they're at least, what are the critical elements that, that uh, every profile needs to um, deal with? I mean, we, I know RefEds has done a bunch of work and others have done a bunch of work to, to try and set themselves up uh, across and, and, and compare, you know, these are the, the assurance, for example, levels that IGTF has established with its profiles. These are these other ones that have come up and, and where do they meet? And um, if you were involved in any of the uh, uh, discussions, particularly involving the US National Institute of Health uh, requirements and, and uh, some um, regulatory things that seem to be coming down the pike about meeting certain other assurance levels, um, you're going to need to be able to translate between those if you want to comply. And wouldn't we rather be ahead of that rather than trying to figure out how to meet uh, those expectations um, with the implementations we have in hand? I see a, a link here, uh, Dave Dreisfrack. Uh, put in a token discovery uh, link for Zenodo org. Um, is that something we ought to look at here and that you want to discuss, or is that just a. a oh, that, that's, hard. That's, that's just the WLCG one. I should have said ah, that. I see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that, that, that was my example of you know, something where WLCG did it out of necessity, but uh, it'd be, be greater. If, It'd be great, I think, uh, if it could uh, you know, be done by a different level or, or wider community. Yeah, if, if nothing else, it ought to be examined by the wider community and say, okay, well, this works for me, but that doesn't. And I think that's what um, Jim Basney and you guys in the group are, are trying to, um, uh, to do in opening up this conversation, particularly between uh, the Cytokens folks and, and WLCG and um, I think uh, uh, 
as we understand these better, um, and perhaps public, you know, maybe it's just publicizing the, their existence and, and inviting the community more broadly to, to comment. Um, in the absence of dissent, uh, you know, people who establish um, uh, standards get to, get to say what, what they will be. If somebody says, I need to go get a standard, oh, look, WLCG has one, I'm going to use that one, right? Um, and that might not be a bad thing, but if it's limited, if it, if it doesn't do what you need to do, um, we're still early enough in the game that, that um, and I think they're listening too, uh, to hear what other people have to, to say about it. Maybe um, another intermediary, uh, more generalized set of uh, profiles uh, may serve a broader community. I was just wondering if maybe um, folk, folks elsewhere uh, in uh, in the among those here today um, can speak to the examples or implementations or things they're trying to do in their environments um, that uh, are not dealt with or that that they didn't they haven't heard what they wanted to hear uh among today's talks or in um you know questions that you you're saying i i still don't understand how to do this or what it is i need to try and um uh, adhere to or who i should be going to for for help on implementing what i have in my situation are there other people with use cases where you're trying to implement uh, authentication and authorization with Java web tokens, uh, JSON web tokens, excuse me, and, and uh, um, that we don't, we haven't heard from. Perhaps we haven't uh, prepared people to speak about that, but Okay, well, um, we're getting long in the day. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes of time. Um, next question I'd like to ask is, if we do another one of these workshops, are there, is there a, a focus that you would like um, us to try and gather speakers, information, whatever on to direct the conversations uh, on these topics uh, in a more productive way. Um, we did point out the one collaboration between SciAuth and, and WLCG, but um, are there other ones we should pay attention to? Are there other people we should be inviting to, to um, learn more about this that others can suggest? So the, the two groups I'd love to hear from in the future are uh, GA for GH, mm -hmm. uh, who have their own uh, token profile, and but are kind of in a, a completely different part of the world, so to say, right? They're they're off in NIH land, and I understand they're doing excellent work, but I admittedly know way way too little about what they're trying to accomplish and and how they're going about it. Uh, the other one that would be really fun next year. Um, as Exceed wraps up and the, the whatever the new access awards are, whatever they may be, uh, to to understand where those sets of organizations are are going within the U.S. Um, I, I'm assuming or, or hoping that you know there's lots of interesting new efforts. You know, nothing like a proposal to writing proposals to, to really sharpen your uh, roadmap. So I, I'd love to hear some, some of those sorts, uh, so, some uh, talks from the, the Exceed community who will be the access community at that point. Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as one who's eagerly awaiting what happens to the access community myself, I'm at a, an Exceed uh, service provider site and very much involved in Exceed. Um, I certainly don't know the answers to those questions yet, and and I do know, however, that many of our resources uh, are continuing past. You know, the the service providers themselves they get 
funding independent of XSEED to operate their um, the resources, you know, the HBC systems or instruments or whatever. And um, we will be expected to interoperate. And uh, what should we be doing as a community of service uh, providers uh, independent of NSF or other organizing um, projects uh, to, to be able to do that effectively um, instead of, you know, waiting to get there. Um, I, I think, uh, I know member, many of our XSEED partners are paying attention to this effort right now um, and are working with our colleagues to, to understand it better. But uh, you're right, that's, a, that's an interesting question that we will all be facing. Uh, in chat, I see also uh, Ron Tapia is asking um, that he would like to know about the GDPR and identities and tokens and how that affects, um, you know, the working of all of this uh, as regulatory requirements um, in different parts of the world uh, come to bear and may limit what you're able to uh, include. Um, while at the same time providing the service for you know universal authentication or federated authentication and authorization that you'd like to not provide um i have also just some oper operational questions that i'd like to know and understand better on um, and maybe get into the nitty-gritty of where exactly we we need to secure things um to make sure that uh People can't impersonate tokens easily, or or uh, fudge the system to stop it from working. You know, if you, if you not necessarily impersonate others, but if you stop, if you can obstruct the flow of authentication and authorization information, how does that you know put the kibosh and everything? So, um, from an operational perspective, uh, and wearing my information security officer hat, that's that's an area that I'd like to understand better um so that that's something that i think has been talked a while but gee i don't know if i can think of anybody who's trying to write up a a threat model for 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 tokens right i, I mean I, I guess we've we've discussed it you know so we, we know there's a problem we just not we're not sure what shape it takes and we're not sure what to do about it yet yeah um, no, i mean we, we've discussed this formally or, or or informally you know in workshops like this but I, I i can't think of anybody who's really say uh written down a you know even a short five-page paper on say the 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 wlcg vision for how token issuers work for resources what what are the threats considered? What are the risks? You know these these sorts of things uh, often are really useful for you know, folks in your position. Uh, I'll call on uh, my colleague uh, Andrew Adams here um, from Trusted CI, the NSF program on on uh, cybersecurity for the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. Uh, Andrew, are you aware of any uh, activities to to model threats in these new authentication and authorization token-based kind of environments? Uh, yeah, Derek, I'm not. Um, there's the, um, um, uh, the the MITRE, you know, threat modeling or the, 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 the matrix that they can take out from the threat modeling there, but I don't think it has, I don't think it's that, that advanced, so to speak, not in this realm. It's certainly something I think that bears development and maybe uh, asking questions and poking them until they're ready to write something and we'll have something hopefully for the next workshop or the next workshop like this, not necessarily this one. Thank you. Um, if I can call on some of my the other folks in the audience uh, whom I recognize, um, what's happening more you know intellect internationally elsewhere? Uh, looks in a, you know are there things in Canada and the way regulations are working there that might um, be concerns with going to token-based authentication? I don't think so, but there was there's going to be a chaotic few months. Uh, the Compute Canada is 
basically going to be disbanded and then there's a new organization to take over. We're told we'll be continue the same operation at least for the next year, but uh, the, open, the major change on the top level, we have <laughs> and very few people like in that organization, now it's called Alliance, Digital Research Alliance of Canada. Uh, has very few people actually understanding the uh, technology used in the high performance um, research area. So, uh, so wait and see because you've got much bigger problems to worry yeah, about. Much bigger problems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, if I may pick also on on Angelo, um, is your community there and their interest in um, in token based authentication primarily linked to the WLCG and other high energy physics community or are there others looking at that in Brazil? Well, um, the guys here are looking at it. They are trying to understand and follow what's going on, but uh, we, 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 well, I cannot say much about it. That's okay. That's fine. I'm just, I'm picking on people because I have time. I apologize if I'm, I'm catching you off guard. No um, David, uh, Grep, do you, do you have any insight into more broadly, perhaps what some of our Asia Pacific friends are doing uh, in this arena? Um, Um, it's actually d difficult for me to say uh, what our Asia Pacific colleagues are doing. There, uh, I, I think for, they are certainly interested in extending the the token based model mainly just for initial federation. So they're uh, pushing for essentially Open ID Connect based federations at the identity authentication level. Uh, I haven't seen much activity beyond the traditional use cases in, say, uh, high energy and astroparticle physics for doing token based authorization at the moment. So they're following but not pushing any new ones apart from those traditional communities. But I may be completely wrong there, and uh, Eric Yen should know that. But I think it's rather. Yeah. Very yeah, I think I think unfortunately we should have asked Eric this question before it got to be two in the morning where he is. Uh, we'll I'll certainly follow up with him. Um, let's see. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you what. Uh, well, here's here's another person I can pick on. Uh, <laughs> Dave Kelsey, uh, what what's going on in the UK with this stuff? Are there other um, areas where they're looking at this or, or attacking it, or have we covered everyone that you know? Well, certainly the part of the UK that I'm aware of, yes, we're very actively following all of this, but it's it's heavily linked into the WLCG activities and what's already going on. A, I'm not aware of new things elsewhere that are something different. Okay, great. Uh, Sorry. JP. Speaking of, thanks Dave. Uh, JP, speaking of XSEED's uh, involvement, do you want to comment at all on or where you think uh, um, this we're going to be pushed going forward, going from XSEED and um, into access uh, with this kind of new yeah. authentication and authorization world? Sure, thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so Exceed has has of course been in the process of transitioning from X509 to OAuth. Also, as many of you are, um, for us one of the challenges is that uh, we are in our last year, so um, uh, we are dealing with legacy technologies like the Grid Community Toolkit, which are still being used by many service providers. Um, and at the same time, trying to move forward as quickly as we can uh, in the OAuth front. So, um, so we are we are definitely using you know OAuth as everybody else is between web services and and implementing web single sign on across web servers, um, and and trying to make head, make headway into uh, OAuth for SSH, 
Uh, we do not have um, we do not have a strong solution yet, but we are piloting uh, uh, open on demand. So users being able to use a fully web based um, login uh, to exceed and then opening web based shell access to resources. Um, can we extend that to the command line? That is a question we are trying to figure out still. Um, again, with the idea that whatever we do, we better do it quickly or even more easily would be, uh, let's figure out what to do, but leave it in the hands of the successor to actually implement it because we don't have time to do it. So <laughs> um, that's a little bit of where we are. Um, and I mean, you, Derek, and and uh, I don't know if Jim is still on. You guys are very involved no. in that too. So if you want to yeah, add, yeah, we are your perspective. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, I think um, um, unfortunately Jim Basney had to go off and 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 speak elsewhere. He's uh, even busier than I am in this area. But um, I would say that uh, yeah, we we have to, if nothing else, we need to understand what the problem is so that we can present the requirements to whoever has the resources to take it forward. Uh, in the XSEED and future access communities. Um, whether we like it or not, you know, in order for us to even support perhaps some gateways, there's a, incidentally speaking of, there's a gateways uh, um, workshop uh, conference this week online uh, next few days. Uh, and I'm sure authentication and authorization are part and parcel of some of what future implementations of all of that has to work with. Um, and uh, likewise, we, we have various user facing uh, interfaces that um, people don't want to have to juggle multiple credentials or credential types or whatever else with so. Um, and this is all part of our attempt to, to move forward and stay current with the, the standards that, that, that exist and at the same time, um, because it is changing the way we are using credentials. Um, we'd like to make sure that we're uh, encouraging uh, worldwide trust um, and uh, yeah. trying to support the, the standards that have been available and that, that still need working on. Yeah, I was going to add uh, the, the one well, the one area where we are making significant headway at today, you know, before the end of exceed is in the area of uh, file transfer and data movement, uh, because exceed is fairly invested in Globus tools and Globus transfer service. Um, we, we have rolled out into production the version of Globus Connect that uh, now is you know fully supports OAuth and in fact supports users uh, uh, downloading and uploading files using HTTP protocols. So um, and you know with OAuth credentials. So so that is that is going to be part of the Exceed at the end of Exceed. And uh, so uh, you know one aspect of our uh, interconnectivity is is well covered with OAuth um, the file transfer. Um, or remote yeah I think it's not as well covered <laughs> right and and but the focus here obviously um, is also the 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 melding of, of authorization information so you know right. when can I when do I get my time on the telescope and when do I point my globus or other data transfer tool at it um, because I'm allowed to download star data between you know 12 and 2 p.m on a Tuesday you know it's uh, stuff like that is, is going to start to get uh, interesting for us. So, well, with that, uh, we're almost on time now uh, to, to wrap up. Uh, I just want to thank again all of our speakers today, all of our presenters, all of our contributors. Uh, and I want to personally thank those who are that I picked on and who are willing to, to give us a little bit of their thoughts. And, and um, there's a, a, a plethora of comments in the, in the, in the uh, chat and everything else. We do look forward to uh, taking the recordings and the transcripts and so forth and producing a summary document uh, that we will make available to the community. And we will also um, make these recordings of the present presentations and the discussion available for others to share uh, to those who are unable to um, stay with us today during, the, during those meetings. So again, uh, my thanks to all and uh, we look forward to continuing the series 
uh, sometime in the next year. Let's, you know, it would be kind of nice if someday we can do this in person and and uh, really duke out the details uh, as needed. But um, for the time being, we will continue to do these virtually if we have to. And um, um, yeah, I look forward to the next What Bananas, which I think is the best part of this, honestly. It's, it's, what, other, what other workshop can you go to that has such a funny name? But it works uh, great, and I appreciate uh, everybody's time. Um, thanks, and, and uh, have a great rest of your day, rest of your week.